Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 251 of your Take Two podcast, your weekly check-in with everything movie and TV related. And this week, I don't have a female co-host like last week. Brian's back, baby. Welcome back, Brian. Are you rested? How was vacation? Tell me all the things. I'm lucky to be back. We're going to talk the numbers of last week's episode and how I'm easily being replaced in just a moment. Uh, but <laughs> I am well rested. I mean, I think you guys vacay like we do. Like you kind of need to vacay from your vacay because, mm-hmm. you know, especially with the kids, you're a similar yeah. father that I am. You're, you're doing stuff, right? You're having a lot of fun. So it was awesome. I, this year, for the first time, did not even bring a book to the beach because since my better. Yeah. Since my daughter's been born, I have not read a page of a book, you know, and, and like I'm with my family. And they're like, oh, I just motored through that book. That was great. I was like, yeah, I was in the ocean. I was building a castle. No complaints. But this year I was like, yeah. why pack it? No, no reason to even pack one. But we had a great sure. time. It was fun. Got some good sun. It was a great trip. Thanks, man. Good, good. I'm, and I'm glad that uh, we held the fort while you were gone. Did you like the episode? Anything to add to the episode? Anything that we talked about or whatever that you have to opine on? I tried to save stuff. For yeah, you. Uh, I appreciate the saving. You did need to do that. I do appreciate you saving. Um, I like the movie Pretty Woman, uh, but I was okay with you guys reviewing it without me. So okay. I, I'm, I'm a fan. So that was fine uh, in that part of the combo. thought you guys are fantastic. Our numbers for last week's up. All of you listeners, go F yourselves, okay? Because... <laughs> Your numbers were phenomenal. And then your social media. Oh, I love a family episode. I love seeing the couple dynamic. So I'm out. This is it, folks. All right, I'm on my way out. Mel, the sultry sounds of of your wife getting on there was fantastic. I loved having you guys on there. And then, so I knew you had a surprise host. And as I'm editing, it was like, whoa, oh, there's more surprise hosts. And I felt bad because we used to have the uh, Rugrat Review music. Sure. The, the intro to it, and I, I, I don't have it anymore, so I actually felt bad there. But they sounded great. It was a great episode. It was a lot of fun to listen to. Usually when I edit, as you know, I don't listen to the show. Yeah, but since you weren't it. involved this week, you were like, I want to listen. As exactly. Fan, now you get to listen to the show. Exactly. I, sounded, I heard what Take Two uh, actually finally sounded like. But the numbers were great. It reflected it. Thank you so much to your family for jumping on. It was a lot of fun to listen to. I, I did enjoy it. And uh, thanks a lot because now my wife's like, cool. Now that gets to be on. There you go. Yeah, because listeners, as you know, in a couple of weeks, Tony's out of town. I'm supposed to do a solo show, but she's like, oh, this would be fun. I'll get to now take my – so thanks, bud. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and and I bet you Melanie still hasn't listened either, so there you go. Even around. though she's been on the show, she still hasn't listened, so I'm sure your wife is the same way. Yeah. Um, I do need to reach out and make a correction for last week. I was called out on the side Ooh, for oh, good. something I said um, – I was talking about the show, Schmigadoon, that you had re- reviewed, and I said S- starring Cicely Tyson. So that would be an interesting show to watch because she is dead. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> so I meant to say Cicely Strong. Apologies, yeah, yeah, yeah. little correction there. So <laughs> All good, all good. Was it our normal call-outer or was it a new person calling you out? Yeah, yeah, former former co-host who wow, likes that to do quality that control all the time again. Yeah, yeah that's all right. <laughs> All right, guys, we have a big show for you today. Jungle Cruise, F9, Zola, Jolt, Blood Red Sky. Uh, the remaining three episodes of that movie that made us will be chatting about. And then Tony's going to finish up his thoughts on Catch and Kill that we first taked a while back. Uh, we do have a uh, What's in the Glass. If you follow our social media, I kind of teased a little bit while I was at the beach. <laughs> I felt I, I had to it. check. Up. Oh, did you not see that on Instagram? I didn't, yeah. Oh, okay. So it. Sorry. You and I have done this last, whatever, five times. Every time we vacay, we wear our gear, our Mm Take Two gear. Um, And so I was wearing, I was like, crap, I'm on vacay. I need to represent. So I did it, and then I was having a What's in the Glass. I was like, oh, we'll we'll have this as our What's in the Glass feature for that. So we have that later on. We've got DC Marvel. We have a huge, at least two big topics I know that we're going to have to discuss during Hollywood News, like very discussion heavy, worthy stuff. So folks, stick around for the Hollywood News segment while we get into some serious repercussions going forward for streaming, for theater, for et cetera stuff. Uh, That's the biggest tease that I can give, and I think you guys will enjoy that. So thank you guys very much for listening. Episode 251. Yeah, yeah, loaded episode. So welcome back. You thought you were on vacation. I'm going to crush you with even more stuff. Lots of trailers to talk about, all sorts of stuff. So yeah, you want to get into it? Let's rock in. Box office results for the week. Uh, I was kind of surprised, honestly, because I knew we had three big releases this week. But with all those numbers coming back of COVID and, and all this stuff and stuff's getting canceled, debuts of movies getting canceled left and right, I was like, oh, this, this might be a bad week. I was like almost nervous to check the numbers this morning. Mm. Um, but I will say the number one film actually over over exceeded their what their estimates were. Um, even though I saw a lot of a lot of stuff online, we'll get to that when we talk about the uh, review of the film. But Jungle Cruise, number one, thirty-four point two million 
at the box office, as well as 27.6 overseas. So not quite as good overseas, maybe, as they mm. thought. Um, but they did come back with Disney Plus numbers for the weekend already. 30 million for the Disney wow. Plus numbers. So wow. almost as much as the box office. So all together, if you do a little quick math there, 91.8 worldwide. Not horrible. Not horrible for a first weekend. However, that film cost $200 million to make, mm. at least. Uh, and we'll get to that when we talk about the review of, as to why it was so expensive. But, um, you know, I think it's, like I said, overestimates where they thought it was going to do box office-wise. But is that a sign of the times? Is that something troubling that we need to pay attention to, that we're getting these streaming numbers are almost equal, you know? And, yeah. and there's a lot of argument going on right now with that, a lot of discussion like, well, would these people have even left their house to go see it if it wasn't available or, you know, are they leaving money on the table because we're paying a family of four $30 to see it as where they would make more sure. in the theater. But are they cutting out the middleman of the theater by just getting the money straight to themselves? So there's a lot of evolution in this system and Disney seems to be making, making decent money with their decision here, whether or not the movies turn out well critically, they've been, uh, you know, making some decent money on these last couple. It is funny to me though, that they only started coming out with these numbers when it kind of backs their argument. Right. Just recently, they're like, well, look how much it made at home. Whereas the right. other films, they didn't do that. Yeah, them, Milan so. and Luca, we didn't hear those numbers, did we? Yeah, no, pick, right. picking and choosing on those. So either way, that was our number one film for the week. Number two was The Green Knight, actually, which surprised me as well. Because oh, really? original estimates had that a little lower in the standings. Sure. It, it was number two for the week. 6.78. Um, so good on that, being the number two film of the weekend. And I heard some pretty good things critically on that. Uh, number three for the weekend was old, 6.76, so those two were very close. It's now up to 30.6 domestic, 17.9 overseas for a 48.5 worldwide, and I want to say the budget was under 20, Ooh. so good on M. Knight for being able, because he finances all this stuff. Himself. It's out of his pocket, right? He knows what he's doing, man, and that's why he, you know, people are like, why does Shyamalan keep getting work and blah, blah, blah? It's because he's doing this. The way he's bringing the money to the table, it makes sense for these companies to be like, yeah. Why not? Because you're going to make money the first two weeks before people figure out that it sucks or whatever. <laughs> so sure, it's worth sure. it for them. Yeah. Uh, number four, Black Widow, 6.4 for the weekend, 167 domestic, 176.5 overseas for a 343.6 worldwide. That's not bad. You know, I think we had talked mm -hmm. before, would it hit 500 even? I still don't think it will. No. It's still going to be below 500, which is, is a miss for them, but... You know, uh, I think given the times and the situation, that's a pretty decent number for them. Pretty respectable. The, the flaw, and the, we might talk about it later, I'm saying with the streaming, is my daughter's now watched it four times. We watched it on a rainy day, and yeah. three people who hadn't seen it, we have it on the Disney Plus, they now got to check it off on their list. Well, that's yes. no more money going into anybody's pocket. So True, true. And uh, <laughs> also with having Black Widow and Jungle Cruise so close together, that yeah. might have also taken some away from Black Widow or, you know, we've already seen it or whatever. Uh, but, yeah, same thing. My daughter's watched it. I think she watched it every day, like the first weekend we got it. And then I caught her watching it like two days ago. Like So it's once you, you pay for it, it's there. So, right. yeah, we'll see. Like I said, every evolving conversation on that front. Uh, and then number five was our other new release of the week, Stillwater, which did way better than I thought it would. Uh, 5.12 uh, million. And that's, you know, that debuted at Cannes. It's an, from an Oscar-winning director, all those kind of things. Right. It doesn't feel like a movie that should be debuting at number five and making that much money. So I don't know. Is that the star power of Matt Damon? And people just are feeling like they want to see some Matt Damon, maybe? Possibly. Uh, the other new release of the week that was worth noting was Nine Days. That came in at 22nd place, but it only opened in four theaters. So it made 18,000 in four theaters, which is actually the second best per average of the weekend besides Jungle Cruise. So, not bad. Yeah, not okay. bad. And that was kind of a big Sundance hit. That was one we were looking forward to seeing um, with, uh, what's his name, Mbaku in there, Winston Duke. Oh, okay. Now, I'm, okay. I wasn't thinking yeah, of what yeah. movie you are talking about. Now I'm with you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I do want to yeah. see it. Okay. So I, I do want to see that one. It's just getting a real slow indie kind of release, but uh, it did well. Mm. So, But that's it as far as the box office for the weekend. Rock and roll sounds great. Let's move straight into the poll results. Every Thursday, Tony drops a poll for you guys to vote on, share on your socials, spread the love across the board, get these numbers up there, and uh, you can vote on from Thursday through Sunday. This week was a good one. What are we at? Uh, just kind of a monthly check-in kind of thing. You know, we were – the month didn't quite coincide with, like, the start of August, but I was just saying, like, what are you looking forward to in the next month of new releases? Because I knew Jungle Cruise was coming out this weekend. Wanted to get that in there. Jungle Cruise, Suicide Squad, next weekend. 
uh, Free Guy, I think two weeks after that, and then Candyman rounding out the month of August. So just kind of in the next month or so, what are you looking forward to seeing the most? Uh, we got a lot of votes on it, actually pretty decent vote count. Yeah. And the number one movie by far was Suicide Squad, 44%. Wow. So I don't know if that's just our DC kind of stands out there taking over yeah. the poll. I thought maybe Jungle Cruise would take it just because of the weekend, you know, Recent hashtag shit. driven. People are clicking on Jungle Cruise. They vote on it, whatever. But um, no, Jungle Cruise almost came in last. It came in 17%. So Suicide Squad was number one. Free Guy was number two. So that's also surprising. Then Candyman was fourth with 16%. So Candyman and Jungle Cruise are very low, you know, at the bottom. Together, whomever, so. whomever posted that Candyman gif as their answer. <laughs> there were multiple ones. Well, it just scared the crap out. I was like, what movie? Oh, I know what movie this is. Okay. Well, see, and that's what I was going to say. We got a lot of feedback, too, a lot of comments. And I'm having a blast doing that. I'm loving just gif, gifing back to people parts <laughs> of the movies. I, I'm loving doing that. Sure. So, um, on on Twitter, we did have Steve from Everything I Love About uh, Movies. Big He's the one Steve. who put – I think he put Candyman on there. Maybe that uh, was the one you saw. Not um, a big fan K- of Steve. Take it back. <laughs> <laughs> KD Time, that's a new commenter for us. I think he got a uh, new follower this week from like a Follow Friday, I think. Somebody had referenced oh, his name, you know, you. one of those kind of things, and we got a new follow from him. So KD Time, he said Suicide Squad, um, as well as Spy Hards, who they were saying they got to see it already early, like a kind of – early screening critics kind of thing. So that was good oh, on them. Lucky. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to do that. Let us know how to do that. Reach out. Uh, as well as Lathan, also a new first-time commenter. He said Candyman. Put another Candyman gif up for you. Because I think I, I was tweeting back, and I did the one that was like, mm, stop, the girl <laughs> from the trailer. <laughs> oh, sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> um, so then we also got a commenter on Facebook this week. So John, former co-worker of ours. Hey! Uh, yeah, he went with the Jungle Cruise, but then he also said maybe Free Guy. He's kind of like feeling the Free Guy ads as well. So, um, And then on Instagram, Shy said all of them. I agree, Shy. I probably will check all of these out. And then Kat said Suicide Squad. He is looking forward to the most. So a nice nice poll this week. Lots of votes, lots of interaction, lots of comments across all of our socials. I love it. Brilliant. Once again, that starts on Thursday, goes through Sunday. Check that out. Vote. We would love to have you. And the commenting below. Keep it up, folks. And a Facebooker. What's up, John? All right. Yeah. All right. Nothing to be said about his uh, age demographic, that he's the only guy that comments on Facebook, and he's like 50-something. He is over 50 now. (laughs) Yeah. Um, All right. Let's rock into these reviews. We've got six good reviews. Eh, Kind of eight, because movies that made us, we're going to talk about three different films. So, but either way, six different shows we're going to chat about, starting off with the big one, the big release of the weekend, and that's Jungle Cruise. The Jungle Cruise. Uh, two hours and seven minutes, I think, is what it's marketed as, but the credits were kind of long, so really it's it's a good two-hour chunk of a movie, whatever. Um, like I said before, $200 million budget, directed by Jamie Colette Serra, who's kind of responsible for the Liam Neeson renaissance. Looking at oh. the film filmography there, it was like nonstop, commuter, those kind of movies, which is like, hey, we like Taken, let's put Taken on a train, let's put Taken yeah. on this, whatever. So... Uh, he's responsible for that. I'm actually surprised Liam Neeson didn't show up in here as like a cameo. That would have been kind of cool, you know. Uh, but of course, is a very this... kind word that you used there. I sure, think. sure. Yeah. The Neeson sons. Uh, but, you know, the stars The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, Emily Blunt, Jesse Plemons, Paul Giamatti, Jack Whitehall, and, uh, yeah, Edgar Ramirez, I, I guess, as well, gets a credit there. Although I felt like he was pretty misused in the movie, not really getting a lot of screen time there. When I saw his name, I thought, who was he? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, we'll talk about that, I guess. But <laughs> this was actually filmed in 2018. <laughs> it has been sitting on the shelf. Um, this was actually in developmental hell, if you will, for 15 years, basically. They wanted to make this back in, I think it was 2004 was the first time they talked about it, after Pirates of the Caribbean was a success. Mm. Um, originally, it was going to star Tom Hanks and Tim Allen and make it like a buddy cop kind of movie with Whoa. them together. So that's interesting. Um, And then after The Rock got signed on, he originally wanted Patty Jenkins to direct it. So that was also like an iteration a couple years ago, about 2015. So this thing has been coming for a while. um, And I think it shows. I think it shows. I think it plays like a movie from 15 years ago. Um, I was into it for about the first hour, maybe. And then I feel like the last half of the movie really started to kind of go off the rails. And it lost me. And I, I just... It's predictable what you expect it to be. It's fine. It was an enjoyable time, I guess. I didn't hate it, but um, it was just, okay, all right. Um, what about you? Did you feel the same way? or? Yeah, I uh, mean, this might be a theme for a few of our reviews from me today in uh, 
I think so. When our show ends after five years and you and I break up and I start my own solo show, I'm going to call it "It's 20 Minutes Too Long" because I feel like I say that about so many films. You know what I mean? Um, I liked it. I enjoyed it, but that but it's still like topping out at a three out of five. Like, can I say that? Is that allowed to be said? You know what I mean? Like, no, I'm with you. I I actually put it three out of five when I first watched it, and then after I thought about it for like a day or so, I was like, you know what? I'm going to knock it another half point back. Even like it's like a two and a half. It's straight down the middle. It's fine, whatever. When but they it, got it is to, too uh, long. yeah, yeah. When they got to the um, the other, the the they got captured. Uh, I'll put you know to, in, in, at the beginning of the third act, and they got captured. I was like, all right, come on, let's. You yes, know, at that yes. point, it kind of lost me. Up to then, action packed. We get a little bit of plot stuff. She can't swim. What's going on with him? There's shady stuff. You know, uh, secrets with the rocks character, Jesse Plemons. I love the guy. If he wasn't in this movie, would we have noticed like his character? It, they made his character very in like just not worthy of being on the screen. Yeah. Like he was great when he was there, but then he would dis- disappear for yeah. Half hour. So I was wondering, was like, like, is he the what bad impact guy? is he having? Yeah, exactly. And then really, the whole buildup of the what we have to get, the quest, and all this really didn't have a great payoff either. It was just kind of like, okay, I guess we got to do it just to do it at the end. Um, yeah. and, and I guess this is a, a big spoiler for me, but one of the biggest negatives of the movie for me was forcing a romance at the end of the movie. Sure. It wasn't that either. was terrible. Um, Emily Blunt and Dwayne were great together. They had a great charisma. Dwayne's great. I thought he was actually pretty good in this. And they had a nice chemistry together. But then when you force it to that romance at the end, it's just not needed. And it just didn't play well for me. And that was also just kind of like, eh, kind of a bad way to end it for me. The script, I, I was, I, I felt like it needed some cleaning. He called her pants 73 times. Yes, and agreed. Like, Which is a fine joke that's... the first maybe three times. And he could have ran with it, but it was like, pants, are you good? All right, turn in the boat. Pants, we're good, pants. Okay, pants, coming around this way. And then she would like, they would almost say the same lines three times in a row. It was kind of like, what? why are we, why wasn't that edited out? Like, you didn't need him to say her name three times and vice versa. Well, so. Different different jokes, whatever. So come up with something else. Because yeah. We saw the ability for him to have these dad jokes, which was, you know, a nice Loved homage it. to the ride. To the ride. Loved that. The part. opening sequence was fantastic with him yeah. doing that tour guide bit and doing the jokes, the backside of water. Uh, they got the fake hippo kind of looking thing. I was like, oh, that's great. Um, but then and then even later, they kind of bring it back where he, they joke together with the dad jokes. So I was like, that's nice that they did that. I thought it was a nice sure. homage to the ride. Um, but, yeah, the pants thing was a big no-no. Uh, what about the fact that we got a fifth time first gay character thing like they're trying to do that again uh, and disney's right. trying to make a big deal out of it like look what we did why it's sure. if anything what you're doing we talked about it before you're beating a dead horse with like let, look at us what we're doing but you're not doing it well because it's very very quietly done elsewhere i think is what they you know the term mm-hmm. they use like oh my, my interests lie elsewhere which i think they're just doing it where it's like oh kids won't pick up on this but you know it's there as parents watching or whatever Right. But then they don't give him any other motivation or reason for that even being part of the movie. It's not like he has a love interest or anything like that. Yeah. Um, and it, at the end of the day, they just make it stereotypical. Like, oh, look, he needed to bring a bunch of extra suitcases. His luggage. Thought the same thing. Yeah. Like, you're doing it in a, in a stereotypical way, an offensive way almost. So why are you doing it and trying to laud yourself as, like, look what we did? Like, just shut up already with that. It's so dumb. Um, it's funny that they he, had Dwayne Johnson ask him, like, why are you here? Like, to shoe him in the yeah. whole storyline in, he legit had to say the question, which everyone was probably asking, like, why are you here? Like, why did you tag along? Oh, it's because. Yeah. It, you and know, and so let's yeah. talk about Jack Whitehall for a minute, because I think he's just, eh, as an actor. <laughs> like, why is he even yeah. here again? Like, I didn't like him really in the movie. I didn't feel like he filled any need. It could have just okay. been the Blunt and Rock show. Like, what purpose did he serve? None, really. Um, yeah. And same with Paul Giamatti. Paul Giamatti just being, like, over the top. You know, whatever, but he was kind of like wasted and not really. You're going to talk about the much. budget in a second. What did they pay Giamatti that they couldn't have just paid you? You could have played that. You know? <laughs> Anybody I, could have, really. Yeah. Well, I'm serious. Like, I was like, wow, you got a huge name in Giamatti just to play that guy's role. Maybe they could have saved a couple dollars. Sure, sure. Um, I will shout out, I did enjoy the score and the use of the Metallica theme. I've heard a lot of people bashing on that and saying oh. it wasn't good. I like that. I thought the way that they used Nothing Else Matters in an orchestral way. They used it kind sure. of at the beginning of the movie and then again in the end. I thought it worked. I thought it was nice. Um, and the score, James Newton Howard, is pretty reliable. You know, he did Dark Knight. He's done King Kong. Like, he has mm-hmm. that big action kind of sound to him. So I thought the score was pretty good. Um, 
We already talked about the opening. I like that one. Oh, I like the twist of the female Trader Sam, like a little homage to the ride, True. changing that up. That was good as well. Yeah, so I will give yeah. a little points for that. Um, and that's the, our girl from Perry Mason. Uh, Veronica Falcon is the actress's name. She was in Perry Mason. Oh, she was I like didn't his, pick up on that. His kind of love interest on the side there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, the biggest, biggest negative for me, though, of the movie, I've got to say, besides one time, I guess, is the CGI. Way too much CGI in this thing. Way too much. And if this sat on the shelf for a year, that's another thing. Why aren't you going over this with a fine-tooth comb and yep. making this look a little... Some of it looked really bad, genuinely bad. Yep. And, like, just polish it up a little bit. And I feel like if you're going for this period piece and you're going for the feel of, like, an Indiana Jones or the Mummy or things like that, do more practical effects. Why can't you make more practical things? Like, mm -hmm. the CGI just makes it look bad. It doesn't mix well with, like, the period of it, and then it's, like looks too technologically advanced. I don't know. To me, that was sure. a big negative. Um, yeah, whatever. I think this was trying to be Pirates of the Caribbean, but it's not right. as good. And it, I don't know if it's worth paying to watch it at home, guys, <laughs> or to go to the theater to watch it, to be honest. Maybe just wait until it's that freebie on Disney+. Yeah, Plus. yeah I think I'm just a little touch higher on it than you are, but I, the things that lost me were that it was a whole crew of guys that were cursed and then now we're into like pirates part two with a whole you know they're all yes cursed. when and, they did the cgi with their faces and all that i was like oh yeah. this is pirates and totally. then you had a b guy and a snake guy and a thing and i was like all right so who's the main bad guy versus who's not a bad guy and then uh i'm not trying to give away spoilers um so i think they shoehorn too much the beginning with the rock on the boat with all the practical things that he's doing with his surprises for the jungle that was great cruise. Yeah. I, I, they could have just carried that straight on through. I almost feel like if you took out Plemons' character and you took out the multitude yeah. of cursed people that he's going up against to then find this, mm -hmm. condensed it, it would have been great. You know, the the storyline is all there. Mm -hmm. Back to the positive. Blunt and The Rock together, their chemistry is fantastic. I thought it was humorous. How many times did a different character mention how large that man is? Yeah, they're just like, oh, you're so big. Oh, you're so huge. Did he, was so it just me, or did he look weird in a top hat too? Like, don't put him in a top hat again. I don't like that look at all. <laughs> That's <laughs> uh, a skipper hat, baby. That's <laughs> well, no, but when he put the top hat on later, I think oh, he was like yeah, when he dressed oh, up or whatever. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 I was gonna say because I just ordered us take two podcast skipper hats. To, That's to fine. I'll wear them all day. Yeah. Um, one thing I, that kind of bothered me too, I had to look it up. This is I don't know. This I found this funny when you have a submarine in the Amazon River. How did it get I was there? like, I was like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, how deep is that river? So it is right. actually 330 feet deep in its deepest point. Oh, so I was like, okay, okay, maybe. But I was like, that's kind of a weird plot point to put a sure. submarine in the Amazon River. Um, I will say also, um, my wife checked out on this an hour in. She left, and oh, then wow. my son fell asleep before the end of it, which he said he thinks that's the first time he's ever done that while watching a first time movie, like. Never fallen asleep like that. So I was like, that speaks volumes to me, like yeah. the way our family enjoyed it, you know? Sure, um, sure. And I was just kind of like out of it too. Like I said, after the first half, I was like, oh, okay. I, don't. I did like the kind of twist, if you will. I don't want to give anything away with that, of The Rock's character. Mm -hmm. I thought that mm -hmm. was enjoyable and it made sense for the role. Um, and I'm with you, like, why not get rid of Giamatti? Why get rid of Clemens and focus on Edgar Ramirez a little bit and give him more to do as the main villain? Right. And I felt like he could have been similar to Jumanji, the way they did with um, Bobby Cannavale. It was very similar to that, I feel like, and it could have been that role. Mm -hmm. Just bring him in here or there, and he's like the main guy. we got to keep going. And then part two, yeah. Clements is the villain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, honestly, go. like, I almost yeah. feel like we put too many villains into one spot. Like, you could have well, said maybe that they knew. Well, maybe they knew they're not going to get a part two, because I don't think they're going to. If this costs that much money and it's not making as much at the box sure. office and all that, I don't know if we're going to get a... I don't think we're going to get a two a jungle twos. A know? jungle twos. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm with you. It's funny. We're, we're being super harsh here to a movie that I didn't hate. No, I didn't hate it either. And like you said, it did have the potential. And especially when you have The Rock and Emily Blunt, and they're great. I just feel like the script went off the rails, especially yes. near the end. Yes. And it really needed some polishing and, it, and too much CGI. And it went on too long. So those multiple complaints just keep knocking it down You know, the ladder. Could have been good, had the potential, but it just wasn't that good. Hit us up on our socials, guys, at Take2Podcast. Uh, you can uh, text or leave a voicemail, 434-602-1931 as well. Facebook, Instagram, what have you. Follow us there and let us know your thoughts as well for the Jungle Cruise. Are we way off here or are we being too nice even? <laughs> All right. It's taken us uh, six weeks to get to this movie. And finally, you got to Fast 9. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I was waiting for it. When I didn't see it the first weekend, and then I read that it was supposed to be like that 30-day-ish deal to get on yeah. PVOD, I was like, oh, I'll just wait. And then I kind of missed it last week. It, it had been out for like a week now, I think, and I just didn't get a chance. So I finally got a chance to catch up with it. Um, another one, 2 hour 25 here, oh but God. the credits the credits are, again, a little long, so I'll say 210 probably of what you actually need to watch. Um this is an overstuffed movie, uh, for sure. Uh, again, this could have been edited down. There's a lot of stuff that could have come out of here. Um, mm-hmm. It's fine, though. It's fine. It's not the worst Fast and the Furious movie. It's not the best Fast and the Furious movie, by far. Mm-hmm. Um, but I liked it better than the last one, I think. I think I'll put it above Fast 8, actually. I didn't really care for 8 that much. So I think I might put this one above that. Um, we get a lengthy flashback sequence in this movie of Dom Dominic Toretto and, as a kid... And we get to meet his dad, and his dad was this race car driver, and we get to see his dad dying and whatever. And I guess this had already kind of been hinted at in other mm-hmm. movies, but now we actually get to see it play out. So that was interesting to see, like, a whole, like, I'm like, oh, are they going to do, like, a prequel movie now that they've, like, established young versions of these characters? So they could do that. Mm-hmm. They could do a whole other series with these characters because uh, awesome. this is supposed to be 1989, and I guess they were probably 20-ish, maybe? So does that make our characters, like, over 50 in the movie? Yeah, who's 20 and 89? Yeah, they'd have to be like in their 50s then in the new movie, like sure. in the new movie timeline. So interesting. It I looks guess amazing. we never really. Wow. Yeah, I guess we've never really established that as far as timeline <laughs> and whatever. I thought the kids that they had in there, because they, they cast young Dom and John Cena. John Cena's character is introduced in this movie as Dom's brother. So they have a young version of him in the flashback scenes as well. Wow. I thought they did a good job with them, casting them, whatever. They did a fine job. But you get multiple scenes of that kind of. It opens the movie that way, and then we also flash back to it a few times to kind of give backstory on the new character of John Cena. Um, some decent action scenes as well, I will say. Like, in the trailer, we saw the one, you got the magnet plane, and you get the car hooking onto the wire and all that. That's kind of your big opening action scene. It's fine. It is very CGI heavy, but it was fun, whatever. Um, you do get a greater sequence later in the film uh, with the magnets, and we saw a little bit of that in the trailer as well where John Cena's flying through the city, through Edinburgh, and then they're using the magnets to push the cars or pull, pull them back, whatever. Hmm. And that, I think they strive to, Justin Lin, as the director, strives to do a lot of that practically. So you are seeing these car crashes for real and stuff, and I will give these movies credit for that. They do okay. some good jobs with their stunts with the cars and whatnot. So there was a lot more car in this movie, a lot more like original Fast and Furious feel to me of like, we're actually car racing more. Like the last movie, it's like, oh, we're driving on ice with a submarine and all this stuff and it's like too much so um the other thing about this movie that i will say negatively is the han character uh, people wanted justice for han and it's great we're getting han back blah 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 i felt like the han reveal was already wasted because we already do it they already showed us in the trailers and whatever mm-hmm. it didn't hit emotionally at all when he's back with the cast and oh we're doing the hugs and we didn't know you were alive None of that hits for me because of the way you did this out of order and you had his character die, but he's also been in the movies after he supposedly died. Like none of it worked for me and didn't hit. And then he also gets like a little side story, like a little short film in the movie where it's like explaining how he survived. Mr. Nobody helped him, Kurt Russell and blah, blah, blah. And and then there's also a post credit scene with him and Jason Statham. So that also maybe kind of leads us to where we're going with the next movie. But I was like, eh, that's that's kind of a negative for me that they the way they handled it, it just didn't hit. It could have been a big emotional thing where like, oh my god, Han's still alive, and could have been a big reveal, and they didn't sure. do it properly. So that was a big negative for me. Um, also, I feel like this movie had this whole series. The biggest problem with it is there's no stakes ever. Like no character, no main character dies ever. Even right. characters who have died in real life, we're still referencing them that they're alive in this world. Like. There's no, there are no stakes, and it's kind of made, it's kind of poked fun at in this movie, where Roman and Tej, uh, Ludacris and Tyrese, they kind of have like their own little side missions that they're doing, and they keep talking about how like, are we invincible? Like, we, wh- how do we just do that? Like, so it's kind of become like poking fun at it, like that they can't die in these movies, because um, yeah. they end up going to space in this movie. Like, we didn't see it in the trailers, we kind of saw it hinted at, but you do see them actually f- go into space in this movie, oh. which is. Re- ridiculous ridiculous that we went there but and and there's even a line before they do it where they're like as long as we obey all the rules of physics then we should be fine and it's like you don't ever obey the rules of physics in these (laughs) movies like so again i don't know if it's them just kind of poking fun at themselves which is good um you know it's a fast and furious movie going to it expecting what you will i think i had more fun with this one than jungle cruise to be honest 
Um, and maybe that's just my sensibilities, my, my personal taste. Uh, this one's also over $200 million. They said closer mm. to 225. Um, we get the introduction of Michael Rooker in here as a new character. Oh, really? So I don't know if he'll be back in the movies coming forward, but that was new. Um, there was a cute sequence with uh, Natalie Emmanuel, the girl from Game of Thrones. She's been added to the cast like the last couple movies. Okay. Um, she had a sequence in there where she's like, oh, guys, I don't know if this is a good time to tell you, but I don't know how to drive. And so like her not knowing how to drive was kind of like a fun plot point of the movie. Hmm. That was cute. Um, right. You know, they bring Helen Mirren back just for like one scene. And we could see her driving around. That was kind of fun, seeing her driving the cars. Okay. Um, nice. Charlize is in here again, but she's also kind of relinquished to, like, a side character. They, almost like a Hannibal Lecter kind of vibe. They have her, like, mm. locked up, and they kind of go and talk to her a couple times in these in this, like, cage that she's in. And I'm like, it's very strange. Um, the John Cena character also, that's another thing that's a big problem with the series. You introduce these new characters who are supposed to be your foil or your bad guy, and then they always have some sort of redeeming arc, and now it's like, okay, they'll be part of the team, you know, now. Like, just like Statham. Uh, right. well, he, he's invited to the cookout now, even though he killed our friend. Like, So so they're kind of sure. setting that up with John Cena's character, too, where it's like what we thought was the issue between the brothers is kind of resolved by the end of the movie. So it's like, okay, he'll probably be back in the next one. He'll be part of the team now. So it's just like such an, a formula at this point that it's predictable. So, you know, I, I'm not expecting high art, but it's like, okay, this is – Kind of what you can you can write these movies yourself if you wanted to. Uh, gotcha. The also worst part of the movie for me, there was a Cardi B cameo. Okay. <sighs> um, and they kind of set her up as like they could bring her back because she has a scene where she talks with Vin Diesel and it's led to believe that they have some background together or whatever and that she's <laughs> working for like Interpol or something. And I'm like, how the fuck would Interpol hire Cardi B? Um <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even understand what they were saying between the two of them in the scene. It was like the worst scene of the movie. So, yeah, whatever. It, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a Fast and Furious movie. If you like these, you're going to like this one. It's not the worst. It's not the best. Go yeah. into it with that and just enjoy it for what it is, you know? Okay. Sounds good. Let's uh, chug along. If you're good to go, we can wrap that up. That's two down, six to go here. Let's get into Zola. This yeah, is, you go ahead uh, and start off, because I'm interested to hear your take on it. Um, this was one of my most anticipated last year, and uh, we finally had a chance to check it out. It's on demand now. So what's Taylor Page, Riley Keough, uh, Coleman Domingo are in this. So the backstory on this one, folks, we've talked about this when we did trailer talk, I believe, and even in the news. Um, true story, based on a true story, these two strippers go on a little trip down to Florida. One of them tweets the entire uh, – ex- the entire adventure that they go on as they're doing, just tweeting away what's happening on this crazy trip that she's on and these people that she's encountering. They decide to make a movie out of it. And that's supposed to be known going into this, that this all stemmed from her sending out these tweets. I, I think that's important here before you guys watch this, that this came from that story where she was tweeting this. And then there was a Reddit thing that, that accompanied it, accompanied it as well. Because and a Rolling Stone article as well. Yeah. Because throughout it, when she says lines, it makes the whoosh, tweet sound the little, beep, 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 yep. Yep, as if she just sent a tweet. And at first, A, you're like, was that my phone? No, that wasn't my phone. Was that my – no, that wasn't my phone. At first, you're kind of like, oh, okay. That was it. And then you get used to it. Usually, folks, I am I am big on I don't like breaking, breaking the fourth wall. I don't like re- being reminded I'm watching a film. It worked so well for me in this movie. It worked fantastically in this. There are many times, and you know, folks, there's times where someone will be texting and they'll put up a little, you know, bubble screen to show what they're texting or whatever. So it's in that vein. But when she's saying things and they're interacting together and it's something that was a tweet or would have been sent out, she's not on her phone. It's just this incident happened. So you would know, okay, so this was, boop, boop, this is tweeted. This is tweeted. Like, almost like stomping your foot, like, this was a moment. This was a moment. Um, so I really enjoyed that. I liked that aspect of this film. The story is messed up. It's crazy. What they go on, the the two girls go down. They they partner up with Domingo. And then and uh, Nicholas Braun plays the boyfriend, who 
this guy's <laughs> this poor, this guy's character is <laughs> funny. I mean, he's supposed to be dumb, so yes. he's being strung along here. Riley Keough's character, Stephanie, is stringing him along to whatever, and he thinks they're in love. They're obviously not. She's a stripper. She's a prostitute. And he doesn't get that or whatever. That's how dumb he is, whatever. But he plays it very well. Um, the acting performances, I think, are fine across the board. I think Taylor Page is good. She shows some good arc. I think Coleman Domingo is fantastic in this. I love this yeah. guy. You know, he yeah. was just in Ma Rainey's, and uh, he was in Selma. He, he's been in a Eel, lot, actually. Eel Street, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it, I mean, there are some cringy moments when they're in hotel rooms and what she's doing for money, and then she realizes how much more money she can get if she just does more things. Meanwhile, the boyfriend's calling her like, where are you, baby? I can't find you, while she's doing X, Ys, and Zs. And so that kind of stuff is like, ugh, ugh. That's, you know, you know, at least she washed up in between gentlemen, maybe. I don't know. But... <laughs> But I love I like the uh, changing of the sheets and the smoothing of the sheets, and I was like, at least they're changing the sheets in between, I guess. <laughs> she was like picking lint or something off for the one or well, whatever. Uh, yeah. And, and so everything you said about the movie, I agree. I totally, totally enjoyed this movie. I thought it was great. Uh, quick story, you know, under an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, co- co-written, directed by Janixa Bravo. I look forward to anything she does now going forward. Um, this came out at last year's Sun- Sundance and then kind of get held up because of COVID and all this. Uh, five five million dollar budget, not a big budget, so I'm sure they'll make their money back on this. Uh, and this is a hard R, like dark comedy, you know. Um, and I like the fact that are you supposed to believe? Like, is this a, you know, like a, what do they call it, a um, questionable narrator or whatever? Where it's like, uh, do yeah. you believe everything that went on? Because then they also kind of give you that moment where the other girl gets her say, and it's like, which well, is this is phenomenal. Hot. That scene was that was phenomenal. great, right? It was and great. Credit to Riley Keough yeah. for being able to stay in character but play different if that yes. makes sense yeah you know what i mean 100 yeah. 100 um yeah i love this uh and it went places you don't think it will go and and i like the evolution of the character of zola throughout the movie because she goes on this ride like yeah we'll go down there and do some stripping and then it becomes something she doesn't expect but then she also kind of gets involved herself and ups her game and like steps yeah. it up and i didn't see that coming from her character so that was good yeah taylor page i'm looking forward to you know she was in ma rainey as well uh, she was on Ballers. She was on White, White Boy Rick, the movie. Um, so I look forward to more stuff she's doing. Riley Keough. <laughs> she's amazing in this movie. And I couldn't help but just think the whole time, this is Elvis's granddaughter. Like, <laughs> that's insane to me. Like, do you think if Elvis was still alive, would he be like, oh, my God, I can't believe it's my granddaughter doing this? And right. the things that she does on on, C, on screen in this. And there's some definitely graphic stuff going on in this movie. So be advised going into that. And to let folks um, know, these are strippers and prostitutes. There is zero female nudity in in this film. Yeah, which is Sorry, a great Gerald. way to do it, though. Which is a great, <laughs> yes. yeah, it's a great yeah. way to do it. There is a montage of male nudity, though, and <laughs> the, yes. the one guy's, like, elephant penis, and it, like, points an arrow, <laughs> like, meh, like, like, that's gross. Like, yes. <laughs> Sorry. That was hilarious. You do see about five or six uh, guys ding-dongs, like, up, up, up but, but it sure. works for the scene. It For that scene, it's like, uh, I don't know. Anyway, sorry, I cut you off. I thought it did a good job of getting you into that female perspective that the movie is supposed to have. Because if it was a man doing this, yeah, you would see much more of the female sure. nudity and, and probably shoot it like the females enjoying it. Like you're seeing the side of like, uh, what these women are doing for money kind of side of it, which is good. Right. Um, yeah. Coleman Domingo, yeah, great. I love the fact that he, when he really gets pissed off, he goes into that accent, like his, basically like his natural accent yeah. for a minute. That yeah. was fantastic. What a choice by him. And I thought it worked brilliantly. Like it sure. really made you creeped out by him, like scared of what this guy could do. You know, yeah. and it explains how they're basically in this almost like a sex trafficking thing for, you know, this weekend or whatever. Um, yeah. What else did I put on here? Um, I wrote a bunch of crap down. I didn't realize that Nicholas Braun, I'd never really seen him in anything. Apparently he was Emmy nominated for Succession. So that movie that show is going to just it, eventually just... we have to watch it. We have to. Uh, also getting Jason Mitchell in here obviously this was filmed a while ago he's since been cancelled but I thought he was good in the couple scenes he was in Um, what else did I write down here sorry what was he cancelled for uh, he had like sex sex assault stuff stuff? and I think and then I think he got arrested also yeah I think he also got arrested with like drugs and guns and stuff too at one point so he's kind of been off the radar for a while um, so this was actually filmed in 2018, so it's been sitting on the shelf for a little while before it got to Sundance and all that. This was originally going to be directed by 
James Franco. So that's another reason why this movie went through a little uh, bit of development and change because of him also being canceled. Um, the score was fantastic. I will say the score, I really like. Micah Levi does this. She did uh, Under the Skin, Jackie, Mangrove. So done a couple good things there. Um, I don't know. I just thought they did such a good job of making it modern, unique story, working in the, the Twitter angle, and just the way it was shot. It was very like modern. Like I said, like we're dealing with Backpage, we're dealing with all this stuff, and and the way that they cast these people to be these, these dirty motherfuckers, and it worked perfectly because all the guys that are responding to the ad are like the dirtiest of the dirty that you could think, you know? Like, how do you yeah. even cast for those parts? But they did such a good job of that. Sure. Um, and, and like you said, getting the male nudity, all that stuff. So I, I loved feel... it. It reminded me of Sean Baker's movie, uh, like Florida Project or Tangerine. Yes. I love both of those movies. Yep. And, and it definitely had that feel to it. Um, but I love it. I love how it just... I feel like this is a movie that's rare that can transcend into that that mainstream. It, it is very indie, but if enough people give it good word of mouth, it could become like a, a rolling hit. And I'd love to see it stay in the conversation all the way to Oscar time. Yes. Uh, Florida Project is a perfect comparison. I, I felt that as well. So, folks, if you saw Florida Project and enjoyed that style, watch it. I definitely recommend watching it just for the – the social media aspect of it, like throughout the film and like, uh, just the sounds and also tone. I, I want to open our show from now on with the prayer that tease Madison gives to the, all the strippers when they're praying <laughs> to God yeah. to send them, send them some classy uh, gentlemen. Well, I'm cleaning yes. this up. Of course, some classy gentlemen with good credit and some big, stuff yes. <laughs> yes either way <laughs> i will like, say my if i had to take a negative of this movie i think i gave it four stars okay um my negative of the movie though is just it kind of ends like you just kind of roll off into the sunset and stuff isn't really resolved and i kind of would have liked a little bit more or maybe even just like a text couple screens of that like yeah. after they got home this or that or explain a little bit more or whatever but it just kind of ended and i was like okay but i wanted a picture of the real life them Maybe something like that. Yeah, just Without something to cap it off would have been nice. Just a yeah, little stinger. Yeah. That's valid. Go check it out, folks. Check out Zola. It's on the band, video on the band. You can find it pretty easily. Uh, highly recommend checking that out. And I do feel we will mention it again, getting closer to award seasoning things. I did not I get so. to. Yeah, yeah, same. I hope just it's not just. I have a feeling it's just going to be like a Spirit Awards kind of thing or whatever. But yeah. I would love to see it just transcend into that Oscar conversation a little bit. We'll see. All right, so you get to watch Jolt. I did not. Tell me about <laughs> Jolt. Is it any good? Ah, well, you're lucky. You, you skipped out on the Jolt. Um, <laughs> this is probably the worst one I watched of the week, to be honest. Uh, oh. I really did, did not like this movie. Um, directed by Tanya Wexler, who did Buffaloed. I liked Buffaloed. I thought that was a pretty good movie. So I think this is only her second big feature. Uh, starring Kate Beckinsale, Bobby Cannavale, Laverne Cox, Stanley Tucci, Jai Courtney, Susan Sarandon even shows up as like a little cameo in here. So... Pretty great cast, and I thought yeah. the trailer looked decent. Like this female John Wick, you know, we're getting more and more of these kind of feels. We just had Gunpowder Milkshake. Like the John Wick influence on a lot of these movies now is very evident. Yeah, okay. you know, with this, or even like Nobody that came out a few weeks ago with Bob Odenkirk. Like we're getting all sorts of these movies, and I think that's all from John Wick. You know, everything's okay. coming from that, that success. Um, this was fine. It, it's almost like a reverse of Crank. Like she's born with this this uh, illness or whatever where she can't control her rage. So then she has this doctor who gives her like a, basically she shocks herself to like keep her rage in check or whatever. And that's kind of the, the premise of the film. Um, and it, that, that was probably the best part of the movie for me is she, we see her doing these like violent daydreams where she's like in a restaurant and somebody's complaining and she's just kind of thinking to herself, like what she would do to that person, like busting them up or whatever. But then in reality, she's just shocking herself to stop her from doing it. And I was like, that was good. The way they did it was good, and it was kind of fun. Um, and it is very pulpy fun like that. Um, I love hearing Kate Beckinsale with her, like, accent. I'm like, man, it's been so while since I've seen her. She looks great. She's over 50 years old. Like, why doesn't she do stuff anymore? But then I remembered, sure. like, her movies just aren't that good. Besides Underworld or um, what's the other one that I like? The romantic comedy with Joan Cusack or uh, John Cusack. Joe might have done the, better. Yeah, no, but this is the one, uh, Serendipity. I love Serendipity, ah, yeah, and I love yeah. Underworld. That's probably it with my Kate Beckinsale. You know, I can't think of any other movies that jump out at me as like, wow, she was great. Sure. So maybe she's just not good, and that's why, because uh, this movie's not good. Um, Laverne Cox, really miscast for me. She's supposed to be like one of the cops in the movie, and I just felt like her kind of sassy attitude that she brings to the role didn't really roll with me as like a believable cop. 
Um, this is only getting a 37 on Rotten Tomatoes last time I checked. It is under 90 minutes, so that's fun. At least it's quick and easy. Um, like I said, the first half hour or so, getting into it, getting to learn the characters, what she was doing, I thought was okay. But then it just kind of went off again. The script wasn't good. Cheesy dialogue. Um, and that was kind of when you introduced these cops and this angle of it. Because the, the first setup of the movie is her dealing with this malady of hers. And then she goes on a date. She thinks she finds this guy. And then, like, her being in love is almost like keeping that at bay now. So she's like, oh, this is great. I've got this guy. And that's Jai Courtney's role. But then... Uh, who apparently also in the movie has a penis that unfurls like an umbrella. That's part of the movie. Okay. Um, she talks yeah. about it after their first night, and she's like, oh, I've never seen one like that, Ooh, like an umbrella, <laughs> like a travel umbrella. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, as it went on, and after his character then meets his demise, it kind of goes off the rails where she's trying to get revenge for his, you know, oh, you killed my brand-new boyfriend that I've only been on two dates with. Uh-huh. So whatever, and that's what it becomes more than anything. So I felt like the first... Half hour or so it was decent. I had fun with it, and it just kind of went off from there and wasn't wasn't as good on the second half. Um, there was also some poor quality, um, like, city scenes in this movie to me. It looked like they were just on a back lot. Like, it looked very obvious to me. Like, they were like, oh, let's just go film in front of these fake buildings on the back lot. Like, it just didn't look well done in that way for me. Um, there was also a scene in here with, like, she's throwing babies in, like, a nursery in the, in the hospital, and it reminded me of, like, uh, Shoot 'em Up. Do you remember that movie, Shoot 'em Up, with Clive Owen? Also not, like, a great movie. So uh, it just okay. had that feel, like a Shoot 'em Up, like a crank, like a B-movie kind of action-y thing. It's fine. It's very disposable. Um, but I did not like it. it. It felt like one of these foreign movies that people go overseas to make for a straight-to-DVD, and it's, like, a paycheck thing for them. Like, uh-huh. Bruce Willis is a prime example of that. He keeps making these, or a lot of the Nick Cage stuff. So... Not good. Not good, man. Uh, I would actually stay away from it. But like I said, it's a, it's a quick 90 minutes. If you're just looking for something to waste some time with for some mindless action, it's it fills that void, I guess. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully we are higher on the next set of mindless action that we got to watch. This is on Netflix. Currently just dropped uh, last week, Blood Red Sky. Yeah. Uh, sick of these motherfucking vampires on my motherfucking plane. Uh, <laughs> it's the only kinda, line we needed. <laughs> I kind of had fun with this, to be honest. Uh, it's a German film. I watched the English dub of it, so I didn't have to read anything. Um, okay, same. The biggest takeaway negative of the movie for me was the annoying kid. I thought the kid was crappy and annoyed me throughout the movie. So yeah. that's the one negative. But I thought the with the setup of the film where you meet this woman, she has this illness, we're not quite sure what's going on with her, they get on a plane to go to New York to get her treatment, then while the train's in transit, it gets hijacked. Like, I kind of like that setup, and then that also then causes her to finally figure out what's wrong with her, like I said, vampires on the plane. Um, So it was kind of like three movies in one, you know what I mean? Like, (laughs) you get that initial setup, you get the middle part, and then the end. Um, It was cool, it had some decent effects. Um, Good bad guy, I thought the guy who played 8-Ball, whatever, like once he turned... I thought he was pretty nasty in there. He's a well-known German actor, Alexander Scheer. I don't really mm-hmm. know him otherwise. No. Um, we get Dominic Purcell for a little yeah. bit of the movie, you know, for the first 40 minutes. He's kind of the only real notable Man. actor for U.S. audiences, I guess. Sure. Um, maybe uh, Graham McTavish also. I liked him. He's kind of at the beginning and the end as that general. He's the colonel, right? Yeah, general. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, you know, he's in the Hobbit movies and the mm-hmm. Preacher show, things like that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was just fun. It was a fun little decent foreign horror movie, whatever. I don't really know what else to say. I didn't take many notes for this one. Uh, that's it for me. That, that's my thoughts. It was fine, you know. It was fine. I enjoyed it. Um, it got a little overstuffed where there's the fight scenes underneath the plane and si- with the cars and all that. I was like, all right, we, we got a lot that we're throwing into this and then getting into the cockpit right now. So it got a lot in there. Credit Perry Bomeister, the actress that played the lead, if she did shave her head for this yeah. like all right commitment to the role good for her um i echo your your thoughts on alexander Shear. he played a crazy wild guy that you know he's just a nut job and he's a psychopath yeah. and, the, but I liked and he, it. yeah it made me want to look him up and be like oh has he been in anything i've seen or can i yeah. see more of him because i thought he was good yeah um the kid if he wasn't in the movie then also the guy that played for reed also didn't need to be in the movie. Like they were true, trying to like force he was, that whole yeah, section in there. Sure. Could have taken that all out of it and just trimmed it up a little bit, but uh, it was fun. It was fun to watch. You're right. This woman has a vampire illness and she's stuck on the plane 
and she kicks into being a vampire while on said plane? Like, what do you do? That, that like, gets hijacked. What are the odds? A hijacked right. plane, and there happened to be a vampire on board. <laughs> exactly. I knew I should have taken the 640. Why did we wait yeah. to the 7? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, something silly like that. Um, so, overall, it was good. A little, you know, could have just trimmed it instead yes. of, like, taking it, uh It stuff was out. over two hours, I think. So, it's like... Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Again, this should be an hour and a half. Like, and you had multiple stories basically. So maybe, yeah, like you said, over over stuff, too many characters or too many plot points, whatever. That, you know, because there was even some flashbacks with like her her husband and like the doctor who they're going to see. It's like we don't really even need those scenes. You could have trimmed out a lot of that. So. Yeah, there was the, the one, there's all these big vampire fight scenes and they're ripping doors off and stuff like that. And then the part of the plane door comes off. And then the guy piloting is like, oh, I'll just turn the plane, nee, like aim him towards the sun. I was like, that wins. That's the winner. <laughs> that, yep, there yeah. it is. <laughs> I liked it, though. I liked it. It was fun to watch. Blood Red Sky. It's on Netflix yeah. right now. I enjoyed it. It wasn't bad. All right. Let's roll into the movies that made us and finish this out. I talked about it last week with The Pretty Woman. Did you have anything else to say about The Pretty Woman that we talked about? Or No, you guys, you guys knocked all of it out. Good yeah, stuff. I mean, it was it was intriguing. I, I think you always learn a little bit about these movies in this show, and that's what I appreciate about it. However, I will say with these last three episodes, I feel like maybe just because we're such big fans of them, yep. a lot of it was like, I already know this, or I've already seen this. Like, it didn't give me a lot of new stuff. That'd be yep. my only negative on this. Like, maybe do some more obscure films, maybe for your next ones or whatever. And yeah, and that's our fault. It is. Will. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, see, I thought so, that you know, watching the Forrest Gump one, I was watching with my family, I had to bite my tongue a few times. I already As knew a, that. Yeah. Well, yeah, like where he got the voice from. And I was like, I almost said it earlier on when they showed the kid actor. Like, oh, yeah, that's how he got Forrest's voice. But I, I bit my tongue. And then when they revealed it, my mom was like, oh, my God, that's insane. I was like, all right, I'm glad I didn't say anything. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, and I think we had talked about it even before, like the, the running scenes that they filmed it with Tom Hanks' brother. We kind of knew that already. Uh, I didn't realize how like how much secret filming, I guess, was going on and how that, much pushback yep. there was with the budget. And, and they were just like, well, we're going to do it and we're going to take money out of our own pockets and we're going to go set up this secret thing and go do it. So that was kind of interesting. I guess I didn't know that part of it. Um, the effects, man, it still blows me away with like the legs and stuff and the things that they did back then. That yeah. looks better than some of the movies we just watched this week. Sure. And sure. that was – 27 years ago like that's insane yeah. so good job on them for that the dude uh, I cut the know. thing out of the boat that was awesome yeah yeah so sinise could swing his legs properly i was like oh wow that's insane sure. that's cool yeah um i didn't really ever think about the com the comparison to rain man either like when they were talking about the run-up to making this movie and how it was kind of in development for a while and the run-up to it and rain man came out and won all these awards and they were just like ah uh, you know Sure. I guess I'd never thought about that, you know, and it didn't really matter in the end though, because once we got it, it did the same thing. It won the just right. the same awards or whatever. Right. Um, I didn't know about them doing the explosion, the Vietnam explosion in South Carolina. I thought that was kind of fun. To, to I want to play that golf course now. Yeah, they were right. like, we're gonna build a golf course. So go ahead, blow it up. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. So um, did that first AD get fired? Yeah, I don't know. Because Zemeckis is they in just the did bathroom. It without Zemeckis, yeah. So, yeah, they must have set it all up, and Zemeckis is like, let, let me hit the the cam real quick or whatever. And yeah. then I guess the yeah. first AD, who normally is the guy that sells that says action, miscommunicated somewhere and says it, and Zemeckis misses it? Like, that part, that was insane. Yeah. As stressed uh, as they all were. But. And then lastly for me, for the Forrest Gump one at least, um, Kevin Bacon almost being Lieutenant Dan. I never knew that. No. And now knowing that, I was like, I could see it. I could definitely see it. I almost sure. – would like to see. I mean, I love Gary Sinise in the role, but I'm like, well, I kind of wish I would have seen that Kevin Bacon as Lieutenant Dan. It could have been interesting. I can see him playing that as an actor. I think it worked out better off the field because Sinise, with his ties to military sure. and then what he's done since then, sure, don't mean this in a mean way against Bacon, but I don't think Bacon would have continued that. You and I, because of our job, have Probably met not. or run into Sinise. You know yes. what I mean? Like, doing that kind of things, you know. Um, so I think it worked out definitely in that aspect. Yeah, it's for, one of those, like, everything happens for a reason. And, and if it wasn't Sinise and, and he did it and then he got inspired to continue the work, which is always good. Yeah. You know, so. so, yeah, that was the uh, the Forrest Gump. The Jurassic Park, for me, again, the effects, the effects. And, and that's the one thing with this batch of episodes. We get a lot of Zemeckis and Spielberg in here. So, yeah. Um, and we're talking a lot about effects. The the way they were working on getting the T-Rex running, like the stories behind all that stuff uh, with that crazy guy. that. <laughs> yeah. With his, like, flat time or whatever. 
Oh, yeah. there's a bathroom I used to use here. Like what? <laughs> when they were like walking through the studio, he's so strange. Uh, but yeah, the technical achievements of all that stuff. And then like how they said like the digital smoothing and they were like, no, Steven, we want you to move the camera here because it's going to make the effects better for us because yeah. we don't have to make it look as good. And he was like, that's great. Cause it, and just think about that shot of, what was it, the Gallimimus right, scene? Yeah, yeah. If that was just a static camera shot as opposed to what they're doing and they're running, it wouldn't be as good of a sequence either. So yeah. things happen for a reason and come together and, and make a really good thing. Uh, the, I, I was laughing at that guy breaking his arm when he like – they were running <laughs> like dinosaurs. Trying to jump over and he falls and breaks his arm. Yeah. Uh, and, and just a lot of kismet went into this movie, you know, like the hurricane sequence. Grab a camera. Let's go film this stuff because we have a hurricane in our movie. Perfect. Right. Let's get some real footage. And that worked out good. Um, and then just I love that they showed the idea of, hey, we want to do as much of this practically as we can. And, mm-hmm. and you know, building these, like, let's dig a hole and get people under here to work this triceratops with the puppetry. And, Oh, this is when you see these shots of the T-Rex, it is the, this humongous puppet that we made. We had to raise the ceiling of the building to be able that to work cool. on it. Like that's insane. Right. Um, and again, this is 27 years ago, uh, 28 years ago now, whatever. Sure. The effects are better in this movie than they are today. Why didn't jungle crews do this? You know, go <laughs> yeah. this light? They should have called that guy sitting in his studio. <clears throat> there you go. Anything yeah, you that, picked up on that one that was unique? This or? one was less, you know, they booked all the actors done. Got the actors they Got wanted. everybody done. they wanted, yeah. Like, so this was more in the technical thing, so it's very, you know, nerdy VFX type things that they were talking about. Very cool to learn them, figure them out, and learn where the doors, you know, Spielberg wanted the doors like in King Kong and, and things yeah. to that degree. And where then they didn't have the budget to finish building the thing so then they were they said well we're still building the park in the movie so just leave the scaffolding up don't finish building the whole set just leave it like that and we'll just work it into it because so you don't think about those things but it wound up working out properly for them so and showing them filming it like we know we're not responding to anything but then spielberg's off camera just going yeah yeah, Sam Neill's like, can you give us something? Give us something here as actors. That's great, going, though. So. That's great. And yeah. that makes you almost appreciate their performances more, that they're, like, in awe of nothing, and they're selling it so well. Um, for some, yeah, for many just, folks, that's that's people's favorite scene in cinema. I Sam still get, taking I still his get gla- goosebumps. Yeah. yeah. And, and I love that he made fun of it. He's like, you don't take your glasses off and look at something better? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I had a blast with that episode just because of the nostalgia feels. It made me want to watch the movie again and yeah. again. Like that's still the movie I've seen the most in a theater. I've watched it probably a hundred times at home. Like I love that movie so much. It just gave me the feels. Um, Makes sense. So, and then Back to the Future. You know, I think we've touched on the Stoltz thing a few times. They talked about. I didn't realize how much they had filmed. I really want to see more of that. You know, mm-hmm. they said they did six weeks of the movie with Stoltz and then had to go back. That's insane. Um, I never knew the almost casting bits of Ben Stiller. That was kind of fun to see Ben yeah. Stiller auditioning for the, the role. The young Ben Stiller, yeah. And then the uh, Melora Hardin thing, how she was basically hired for the role, but then they fired her once Stoltz was out because she was too tall for Michael J. That Fox. Sucks. Totally sucks yeah. for her. That sucks. Super sucks. Yeah. Just, I mean, she got so, Jan eventually, so. Just think of that like in today's context. And we kept talking about this. I, again, I watched with my family at the beach. Like if they're filming Jungle Cruise and like <sighs> – this chemistry between the rock and blunt, it's just not working. Sorry, Emily. The last six weeks, yeah. <laughs> we're going to move on at this point. We're going to start <clears throat> all over with a brand new actress and reshoot all the – like that would not happen. You know what I mean? Like I don't feel – that that's insane that they made that decision. You know, And they didn't exactly have the big studio backing to start the thing. So they yeah. had to – start all over again, and if they didn't have the one guy saying exactly what he said, like, well, you can just start it all over again – they had to freaking do that. So then I'm thinking, think about the crew. They've already filmed it with Stoltz. Now you get this other dude in here. They yeah. have to bend over so that they can make sure that Fox films at nighttime because he's got something else he's doing during the day, family ties. So now you got to film at nighttime. And that's a, they had to have been resentful to Michael J. Fox to a degree, as amazing as he was. You know, just little things I'm trying to think like, wow, that, <clears throat> that shoot must have been so insane. But then once they got that first one in the can of, of him and Christopher Lloyd together, they probably were like, Oh, this is it. This is what right. we should have had. So once you get that that you know yeah. little bit of positive reinforcement, you're like, okay, good, we did the right thing. Sure. Uh, yeah, like you said, that's probably unheard of still to this day. Um, the only thing I can think of is like right now, um, what's his name from Star Wars? He just backed out of that movie, and they're gonna have to like go back and reshoot 
a lot of it that he left. So like every once in a while it does happen, but usually it's not to this point where it's like we want to do it, you know, and, and change the, the roles right. or whatever. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there was some other stories in here, the Crispin, Crispin Glover being weird. We kind of know that. Yeah. And, what what ended up making him not be in the second movie the the space band from Pluto thing you know whatever yeah um, it's gonna be a refrigerator then they switched it and then, how interesting which, that there it was gonna be Ford Mustangs yeah yeah instead yeah. of the DeLorean that's interesting that it was almost that that would have been maybe Michael different. Bay could have directed it then because he loves yeah. you know, the car commercial angle of those things sure so. sure yeah you know if you're a fan of these movies like we are this show's great I just feel like this batch was a little bit like uh, we already know a lot of this. And a little bit narrow with like their focus of like a lot of Zemeckis, a lot of Spielberg. Yeah. So maybe maybe the next batch will be more mixed up, and maybe a little bit more movies where we'll find some more interesting tidbits. But like you said, that's just our fault because we're huge fans of this stuff. Eh, so. it, maybe they listen great. to our spotlights. They probably listen to our spotlights. Yeah. All like, oh, a lot really of good. the stuff from the Zemeckis stuff was in there about him, his student film. I was like, I watched that for our spotlight. Right. Like, <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I always highly recommend this show. It's a lot of fun. So and it's just like one of those. Oh, you got forty five minutes? Like let's just watch this. Whatever. It's just kind of there for you on Netflix. Yeah. Nice easy yeah. watch. Movies that made us on Netflix. We're going to take a quick breather, and we'll be right back after this break. All right, so real quick, I finished up that Catch and Kill on HBO. Um, I talked about it a few weeks ago. It's based on the Ronan Farrow book, which he then also did a podcast form of it. And this is basically just a filmed version of the podcast. It's him interviewing people that were involved in this Harvey Weinstein case. So... um, it was six episodes. I think the first week I talked about it, the first two episodes were out. Uh, they did three weeks in a row, two episode drops, so not a big wait to see all of it. And they were all under a half an hour. Um, just a fascinating look at the Weinstein case. If you're interested in that at all, like this is worth it. Quick, easy watch. Um, it is very heavy subject matter, talking about rapes and sexual assaults of these women. Mm-hmm. But I did find out a lot more about the case, a lot more backstory on it. Um, some of it's a little infuriating to think, like, why did it take so long to crack this open, you know? Um, and then they also, I think it's the last episode, they get into the idea, of, which I never knew, that Harvey Weinstein basically hired a company to follow Ronan Farrow, like a spy, to like follow him and maybe look for like a way to blackmail him to kind of stop him from reporting really? on it, whatever. So they, huh. the lengths that he went to stop this from coming out was pretty, uh, pretty evident, pretty crazy. So yeah, it's good. And, and each episode focuses on like, here's an interviews with some of the women, some of the accusers. Here's interviews with the people that work on the journalistic side. Here's an interview with this guy who basically the guy was spying on him turned and, and notified Ronan Farrow. Hey, I don't feel like this is right what we're doing. And this is involved with this case that you're trying. Like, I agree with you trying to expose this case more than I agree with what they are asking me to do as my job. So it's kind of good that this guy turned as well and helped out in the end. Um, so it was interesting in that way. And it's, at the end of the day, it's just a filmed podcast. So you can either listen to the podcast, you can watch this, or you can read the book. Either way, you're going to get kind of the same information, but this was the quickest, easiest way for me to get it, and I was interested in that case. So it's cool. Check it out for that reason, but just know it's heavy subject matter, you know? What's it on again? The HBO Max. Ah, I have that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Things we're going to be having in the future are these actors in these films, and this is our casting couch. Casting couch for the week is uh, a there, little There's busy. one I know you really want to say. There's one I know you want to do. Well, let's see if we're right, because I'll start with that one then. If yeah. it's the one you think I want to say, Tom Hanks is going to be in the next Wes Anderson movie. Ding, ding. <laughs> yes, I'm excited about that. Yeah. Uh, they said it will probably just be a small role, um, and this is the movie that we don't really know a lot of details on. They haven't released a title, anything, but they are already filming it in Spain. And it's with uh, Tilda Swinton, Bill Murray, Adrian Brody. A lot of his normal people are going to be back. Bill Murray's in it? What? Yeah, exactly. So, But I'm pumped. I, I'm just adding one of my favorite actors to one of my favorite directors. Crazy. You know, cast list. That's great. I love it. So, uh, Let's see. No, no, fish? no. Stop it. Huh. Huh. If you want to hear more about Wes Anderson. Oh, there you go. <laughs> go check out our spotlight. Is it actually available still? Yeah, it is. There it yeah, is. it is. <laughs> Not not the Bill Murray one. I don't think that one's available anymore. Nor is Hanks. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, sorry. Let us know. <laughs> Maybe I'll on send Patreon. This. I'll send it to you on the side if you want to hear those. But Wes Anderson's <laughs> out on, on your feeds now. Check that out. Uh, Tiffany Haddish doesn't have a spotlight yet, but her and Lakeith Stanfield are in talks for the new Haunted Mansion movie. So, Ooh, okay. The next ride. Could be interesting. You know, the last one wasn't a well-received version, the Eddie Murphy version. 
So right. I'm kind of looking forward to this. I hope that they do it justice. We'll see. And I like these actors, so I know. Okay, I'm down. Agree on uh, those We're going to talk about uh, the Penn family a little bit. We already talked about the Spielberg family a little bit today. Um, Hopper Penn, who is Sean Penn's son, has been cast with Brian Darcy jo- James, Brian Darcy James, uh, in a film called The Right Away, which is going to be the first directorial film by one Destry Spielberg. What? Steven Spielberg's 24-year-old daughter. Wow. Yeah, so she is directing Sean Penn's son. And guess what the source material for this is? It's a book written by Owen King, Stephen King's son. <laughs> all this just means that we're old. That's all yes, this means. <laughs> I was like, this is just like the next generation of Hollywood taking over. No, uh, that's it, folks. Kidding. We're done here. Cause wow. That's crazy. Okay. you got to check out. Yeah. Uh, all right. So Regé Jean Page has been cast in Paramount's The Saint reimagining. They're doing The Saint oh, over really? again. That works for me because we were saying kind of like maybe he could be a Bondy kind of character, you know, like a spy guy. So okay, sure. I think that works. Yeah. Uh, Lily Rabe has been cast in the First Lady show that's coming to uh, Showtime, and she'll be playing Lorena Hickok, who was possibly like a love interest for Eleanor Roosevelt. A lot of people that's been like kind of questioned for a long time, like was she having a lesbian affair on the side, and that's who this woman was. Uh, so she'll be playing that, and Eleanor Roosevelt is played by Julian Anderson on the show. So. It'll be interesting to see the two of them together. I'm really looking forward to that show. Every, like, casting information that comes out of mm-hmm. it sounds really interesting. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then lastly, I think for me, I saw Nicholas Holt and Anya Taylor-Joy are joining The Menu, uh, which is the new film from the Succession director, uh, Mark Mylod. Is that his name? Mylod? Uh, and writer Will Tracy. So, again, Succession coming around. We need to watch this show. Uh, and this also has already been announced that Ray Fiennes and Hong Chao are also in this, so quite cool. the cast there for that. It sounded interesting, too. It was, like, people traveling just to try this restaurant or something. It was. It almost sounded, like, dark and yeah. conspiratorial the way that the, the setup for the story was, so I'm kind of looking forward to it now. Uh, you have made on your tele There you go. Anything else from your casting? Jerry and Marge go large uh, based on a true story about a couple. Oh, shoot. I forgot to write it down. I want to say Minnesota that win the lottery and then go back and like fix up their small town with all the winnings. Uh, Brian Cranston, Annette Benning are playing Jerry and Marge uh, in that. Sounds like it could be fun. Something unique. Sure. And I feel like we don't see enough Annette Benning anymore. She like comes out every five years and does a killer project and then goes away again. True. People started doing the uh, the scene with her and Spacey, and they're like, "Ooh, that remember she was in the American Beauty." Uh, anyway, um, all right. I don't know if this is good or bad news, but we are getting a cameo from a league of their own in the TV show. Okay. It's Rosie O'Donnell. That's bad then. Yes, that's, yeah, that's not the one I wanted. Um, maybe no. it opens the door. Is John for Lovitz you? busy? Like, come on, bring him back. Something. <laughs> Gotta head home, give the wife a pickle, tickle, and then back out on the road. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, so Rosie being in, I'm just hoping that opens the door for, you know, if you get anybody else in. Yeah, that would be there, nice. Right? Yeah, so. Echoes. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. Echoes is a Netflix uh, psychological thriller. Michelle Monaghan and Matt Bomer are starring in that together. Cool. Sharper is coming to Apple and A24. Julianne Moore and Sebastian Stan both play competing con artists. Okay. And lastly, oh, lastly, here's a little Broadway for you. Take Me Out. It's based on a baseball team, follows a baseball team. This is a play, not a musical. It is on Broadway. It opens in April. But uh, Jesse Tyler Ferguson, Jesse Williams, and Patrick Adams, a uh, big fan of his from Suits, uh, are all on that. So I thought I'd throw a little Broadway casting out there because there's some big names. There you go. Hopefully it can come back and sustain. You know, Hopefully it doesn't have the same issues that the movie theaters are having right now. Agreed all around. We will talk a little bit more about that, sadly, in a few moments in our news. But for right now, let's do a little what's in the glass. Yeah, tell me about this. This is from your uh, your vacation, right? Yeah, and I put this up there. And buddy, this is from you. You bought me this as a gift when my son was born back in January. I totally then... missed this if you put it on the socials, too. I totally missed it. Sorry. Yeah, it was on, it's okay. It was on our Insta story. It's all good. Um, I grabbed a bottle of this. So it was with the family. My father's a big bourbon guest. I was like, hey, you've got to try this. Uh, Tony bought it for me, and I drank it too quickly. I drank this one too quickly. Oh, I meant to. I was going to bring the bottle because on our Insta story, it was like 75% full it's not 75 percent full anymore but this is calame uh bourbon instead did it say kentucky bourbon 
It is delicious. It is a 74% corn mash. Anyone that knows bourbon, to be a bourbon, you have to be 51% use of corn. This is 74, so it gives you a little bit of that bite, but it goes down nice and smooth. It's delicious. When I was looking up things for this, it's 86% proof, if that's what you guys were wondering. Um, I'm a big fan of this bourbon. The farm itself did not know this. Big into horse racing. Two Triple Crown winners, eight Kentucky Derby winners, and eight Prickness winners. Wow. And eleven yeah. horses in the horse uh, racing hall of fame. I was like, wow. I'd like to. I'd like to say that's why I bought it. No, it wasn't though. But, <laughs> but that's good that that worked you out for you. Horse racing. No, I'm just glad it worked out that way. That's cute. So <laughs> it's it. So uh, so I threw it up. Uh, that's ours because uh, you bought it as a gift, and I've enjoyed it ever since. So Calame, I, my my dad and brother were calling it Calamet. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's Calame. I, I think the Calamet yeah. might be like a Maryland thing where you, that's how you guys talk over there. Um, Which is weird because my dad's in Pennsylvania, but uh, it might well. be. It might have been. Yeah. Well, or in Kentucky, <laughs> yeah. that's our Calumet Farms. So maybe. There you go. But that was a, actually a recommendation from one Kevin Bednars, who from the All Star Comic Con and you know restaurant tour. That's his favorite bourbon. It's always his go to. Even nice. he's had better ones. You know, supposedly better ones, more expensive ones, whatever. He always goes back to that one. So really, okay. Yeah. All right, well, then I'll continue on with my USB mic on to our trailer talk. There you go. That's Keeps working cut. for me, That's man. a, a couple deep, years. Cut, deep cut joke. That's the only you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one All person. All right, uh, we had nine trailers this week. Uh, Woo! Let's start off with the animated one because it's actually coming out this week. Mm. Uh, and it said trailer number two, and I don't remember seeing trailer number one. I know we didn't talk about it. So no. Vivo, no. Vivo, coming to Netflix this weekend with one Lin-Manuel Miranda in there as the Kinkajou character. I thought it looked cute. I thought it looked like it was kind of fun, had some heart there. Uh, Sony Pictures Animation. It looked good. It looks like a lot. Uh, it looks, you know, they're going to go on this journey, try and find the Fountain of Youth type thing with this older couple that needs to find each other, that loved each other at a time, but they're using the little <laughs> Kinkajou, as, as you said. Uh, I, I, we like Lin Miranda. Miranda. I'm in. Yeah, I, I, I think he. Uh, I think it's something that he continues to do is bring these like ethnically diverse stories and casts. Uh, and I think the music sounded somewhat like Moana-ish. Like obviously he's lending his voice and his songwriting abilities again. Um, and we love the Moana. And I noticed Gloria Stefan is listed in the cast, so that's awesome. My first concert I ever saw was Gloria Stefan. Wow. I was I like seven that. years old, and somebody spilled a beer on me because I was like shorter than everybody. And my mom bitched out some guy. That's all I remember nice. about it. But, yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> so, yeah, there's the Vivo, and it's coming this week to Netflix already. Um, we got our look at House of Gucci, the full trailer. Lady Gaga coming for another Oscar nomination, I think. Yep. Um, but I will tell you one thing. If you didn't tell me that was Jared Leto, I would have had no clue. No. How no, not Jared at all. Leto? How's no, Jared the, Leto? the makeup department, definitely uh, hardcore. I can tell you my negative on this. The accents? Uh, well, okay, yes. Uh, that might be a bit much to take. We'll see how that plays out. I don't know if I like Pacino in this. Yeah, and he it, looks like he's going to be a little side characterish. I hope. So maybe I not hope. As, yeah. Because Gaga had some, you know, her hairstyles and the, and the thing. Driver didn't look exactly like Driver. Obviously, Jerry Leto doesn't look like whatever. But then I was like, oh, and Al Pacino. Like, yeah. I, I, and I was like, oh, don't do that. Don't do that where you just give me that guy where all I see is Pacino. Hopefully he's very sure. side, he's very minimal, and, and he can act. Uh, that was yeah, the one thing that I mean, took me I, out of it. But. I thought he did a good job of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, kind of making, like, a little character for the couple scenes yeah. he was in. So if sure. he can do that with this, maybe. We'll see. True, true. Yeah, I'm with uh, you, though. Gaga for that it, Oscar, probably. It definitely looks like it, right? It definitely looks like it. And like you said, maybe costuming or makeup, oh, things like that. So it could be a player. It could be a player. Uh, Flag Day is coming November from Sean 24th, Penn. November 24th, by the way. November 24th. Oh, for that one? For Gucci? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Uh, Flag Day, Sean Penn starring, directing, and his daughter in the film also, Dylan Penn. Looks pretty impressive there. Um, this debuted at Cannes. I want to say it didn't get very great reviews at Cannes, though. Oh, bummer. Yeah. Uh, but it looks intriguing from the trailer for me. I, I, I'm in. I liked Sean Penn as a director. I thought Into the Wild was great. Um, and I don't really mind him. I, I know off the field people have stuff about him and don't like him, but True. I don't mind him as an actor. I think he's usually pretty solid. Um, she looks like her mom, big time. Yeah. There's like two quick scenes. I was like, oh, Robert Wright said this? Oh, wait, no, that's not Robert <laughs> she, like She looked exactly like it. Um, and then Olivia Vetter uh, does the music for this. Oh, uh, okay. Eddie's Kid? It's got to be Eddie's Kid, right? 
I would guess, yeah. That's interesting because he worked with Sean Penn on Into the Wild, so. Right, right. I want, what, what's the connection there? Like, how do those two get linked up? I don't know, it's weird. <laughs> Either way, Either way uh, I'll, I'll probably it looked, check it out. It looked good yeah. to me. It comes out August 20th, um, so I'm, I'm still in. We shall see. Okay. What about uh, Lamb? Lamb probably is the most non-Brian movie that I told you to watch this week. Oh, my this God. This is from A24 so <laughs> <laughs> with Numi Rapace. What is happening in this? <laughs> this is the weirdest trailer. This is the Sweet Tooth sequel, isn't it? Is that... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's going on in this trailer. I'm so, guessing it's some sort of allegory going on here for, like, childbirth or like being I a guess. parent or something i don't All right, know so it looks very strange farm, they're on a farm and they're raising lamb and sheep and whatever uh farm and then they give birth or a, a a lamb gives birth to another one but it has a child's body and a lamb head very weird right? it seemed very weird but then also when beach boys comes on i was like into it i was like okay this is good. <laughs> Definitely the most perplexing thing we watched all week was this trailer, and I just don't know I, how I feel about it still. I missed when it's coming out, by the way. It didn't. It just yeah, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, sorry. I don't know. Uh, what about Card Counter? This is coming with Oscar Isaac and Tiffany Haddish. This one's coming in September, I believe. Uh, yeah, the what do you think about that one? September yeah. 10th. I like gambling. I like movies about card counting, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, this is Oscar Isaac playing kind of like a darker role he had to go to jail he learned how to count cards now he's trying to steal money he and haddish as love interests intriguing yeah. choice there intriguing choice um she looks like she's doing all right in the trailer though yes i was gonna say maybe can this be something where haddish actually shows us that she can do a little bit more give, give us yeah. a little different uh, take on her acting abilities so i mean yeah. the movie looks good i want to watch it yeah, it, the trailer was a little messy for me. It looks like there's a lot to this movie, so I'm hoping that they can. Oh, does he serve all in the that. army too? Yeah, I think there's army stuff. I think uh, there's going to jail. I was like, is this Cherry with Oscar I, Isaac? Because I don't same. want that. Nope. Yeah, same. <laughs> so, but I like Oscar Isaac. I'll give it a shot. And also, it's from Paul Schrader, director uh, who did First Reformed was his last one that was kind of big with Ethan Hawke. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, he wrote Taxi Driver, like all these movies back in the day. So he's a very big name in Hollywood for sure. Um. What about the Chucky series? Gave me to look at that. <laughs> this trailer actually looked really good. If I was into horror like you would, I think I'd be all about it. <laughs> I am definitely all about it because okay. they're getting the original voice back, everything. Like it looks more traditional like the old Chucky movies. I didn't hate the new Chucky movie. I had fun with it. Okay. But um, yeah, this looks good. And I kind of like the idea of making it a series. We'll see how it plays out. I don't Sci -fi? hate the Chucky element because I always found it funny. Yeah. Um, you know, even in this, he's like, hey, let's go kill your sister. And she's like, I'm tired. And he's like, snooze, you lose. You know, yeah. little one-liners like that are good. So it comes out October 12th. Perfect. Perfect timing. Uh, okay, let's get into Army of Thieves. This is the prequel to the Army of the Dead. I'm I'm in. I think this looks better looks than Army of the Dead. I agree. Uh, I, I think his character was probably the best character from the movie. So it yeah. was smart for them to kind of take him out and make his own thing. And yeah, it looks good, man. I'm, I'm check it out. And we know we're getting another Army of the Dead as well. So creating their own little universe over there in Netflix. I didn't get the release date on this either. Obviously, it'll be I soon. I don't know that they gave one. Uh, okay. I think it might have just said fall or whatever. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It, it is coming soon, yeah. yeah. Okay, and then the two biggest ones of the week. I'm trying to bury the lead as I go here. I've noticed. Uh, it's okay. We're building suspense. I, I'm going to go to King Richard here with Will Smith, the Williams sisters story. Uh, he's coming for that Oscar nomination yes. too, right? Yep. Maybe he'll 100%. win this one. What do you think? Oh, a hundred percent. And I fantastic. think he's setting up him and, and Denzel going at it again. 20 years later, 2001, he lost to Denzel training day versus Ali. And now I think we're going to see it again with him and uh, Denzel being in Macbeth. Uh, this looks fantastic. This looks great. I mean, just knowing their story a little bit, we know how crazy this guy was, or maybe still is, whatever, you know, the, the story of the Williams sisters' father. Um, I had forgotten that they have so many other kids, too, in yeah. the family. So I guess we're going to deal with that a little bit. And we're dealing with just that mindset of people come to them and say, you know, you're pushing these children too hard. And his response is, yeah, and. Yeah. So what? Yeah, look, and, look at what it's producing. So. And just the recognition of what those girls are going to mean to the future of the sport, to black children, to black girls, all that thing. Like, I like that they're going that way with it. Uh, it looks great. He looks great. We have a spotlight coming on Will Smith to coincide with this release. Really? So uh, I can't wait to talk about him as an actor. And I feel like he's getting better 
or, or making more interesting choices as he's getting older. And I like sure. these drama roles for him. So yeah. we'll see. Uh, and then lastly, HBO Max also, also Ooh. HBO Max for that one, uh, November 19. Yeah. <laughs> no, not leaving my house. All right. Cool. The way things are going, we won't be able to leave our house anyway. But anyway. And before we close, we're closed on trailers. We're going to talk about Ghostbusters Afterlife. What do you think about this? Buddy? As if I didn't want to see this movie more. Oh my God. Are you serious? November looks 11th. Good, right? looks it good. looks fantastic. Everything about it. Um, I'm still having issues with ecto-1 driving through the wheat field like where yeah where it had, i like the and, uh, the gunner seed and i like the little like um remote control, remote control thing there. That was yeah. Kind of cool. yeah what is that um it and then it, it just it teases us with with Ackroyd at the very least being yeah um it, it looks great and i i love the homage that i feel watching this to egon like the casting of those two kids they look like egon like it's perfect sure. Like, sure. good job on that. Um, hopefully Paul Rudd's good in here. I will say I did see, like, a sneak peek thing of some toys from this movie. And they have the three original guys in the outfits. Like, okay. looking like they do now. So, like, Ackroyd, Bill Murray, and Winston. Uh, oh, okay. Gotcha. All back. So, I'm like, are we going to see that? Uh, was that, like, a spoiler for the movie? Don't are we going to see them in costume again? I hope so. Maybe. Maybe. So, that yeah, looks cool, man. I can't wait. Uh, this has been... We've been wanting to see this for a year and a half, so I cannot wait. That's it, guys. That's going to wrap up our lengthy trailer talk. Hit us up again on all of those socials and let us know your thoughts. What are you looking forward to coming out later on this year? We're going to take another break and be back with the final act of our show. So Olympics are right now. Mm -hmm. Watching the Olympics. And this happens all the time. I'm watching the divers, right? These girls springboard dive up. They do triple twists, flips, backflips, things, bang, hit the water, splash, dead straight. And in my head, I'm just like, are you kidding? That's insane. That's yeah. nuts. How do they do that? That is awesome. Whatever. The announcer's like, ugh, so flawed. How? Why did she even make the trip to Tokyo? That yeah. was a horrible performance. I'm like, what are you watching? That's nuts, lady. You go do it. It's just funny. Like the judges, yeah. what they can see versus what we can see. I have that problem, period. And I saw a couple of funny tweets that were like, we should have somebody that just goes up and does it first, like a regular person, so we can kind of like compare. <laughs> like, You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's actually a good idea for the Olympics. Like, here's sure. Joe Schmo doing it. Now we'll see the pros. So you can tell like how much better they are. And yeah, those sports where it's like you're judging, it's hard to tell. Because like you said, we're thinking, oh, that looks great. And they're seeing who knows what. But yeah, it's been fun. We've been watching a lot of it, especially the swimming yeah, uh, we've been getting into that, and uh, it's been great. It's been a lot of fun. The gymnastics stuff is interesting. I saw Biles is coming back to do her last the balance beam. So cool. See what happens okay. there. But uh, our swimming did great. So yeah, um, that's why I was rocking my Maryland Maryland's for champions. Have to try and wrap there. The uh, we were we we did a pool day, a little brief pool day, and I tried treading water, mm -hmm. and then rising up like the water polo people do. Mm -hmm. These people have got to be the most underrated shredded athletes, right? We, I think we talked about this in our Tim Burton spotlight because they're treading water the whole time. They never touch the bottom of the pool, and mm -hmm. then they're able to get their bodies like all the way to their waist, like to rise up and block a shot or throw the thing. I did not rise whatsoever. Like my shoulders yeah. made it out of the water. Like how do they do that? That's nuts. It's insane shape. Absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. It's funny because my son, he's when he makes it into the further into the season, they do like smaller practices, um, and they'll do water polo as like just a fun practice day, okay. and just like hey, let's play a game. But I'm like, you guys are really working out too, like when you're doing that, because that's that's a tough game to play. And he was surprisingly good at it. I was like, man, is there like water polo leagues around here? I need to get him in this. He's actually pretty good. So like saying, no, you're moving, you're going south, yeah. so he can full full round year, full round year. Holy God, there let's talk go. about. Let's talk about movies. Hollywood news. All right. Uh, I'm going to start off with some of the light, the uh, sad news of the week. Uh, so we had a rest in peace, kind of. Uh, Dusty Hill, the ZZ Top bassist, 72 years old, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. He passed away this year. I want to mention him just because he is in a movie, Back to the Future 3. So oh. I figured it counted here. That's right. Do, 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 do. do, 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 do. <laughs> so, yeah, Dusty Hill has passed away, sadly. Just wanted to mention that. Uh, also, we almost lost Bob Odenkirk this week. I don't know if you saw that. A few people thought we did. Old, yeah, collapsed on set of Better Call Saul. Uh, they said he had, you know, a heart related incident, but I guess he is doing better now. But I guess it was kind of scary. Touch and go there for a minute. 
Yeah, I saw his son was the one that had to like tweet out like yes. he's okay for a minute, and then Bob came yeah. back and tweeted too. So. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm gonna wait a minute on some of this other bigger news. Let me get a couple other things out of the way. Uh, they are already working, already filming a movie right now called Skull, and I guess this kind of flew under the radar because people didn't know what it was. This is actually going to be a Predator prequel. And it's being filmed by Dan Trachtenberg. Uh, I like him. He did 10 Cloverfield Lane, which is a really good movie. Um, as well as this week they announced we're doing a sequel series to streaming for Waterworld. And Dan Trachtenberg is going to be involved in that as well. So multiple news points for him. I didn't know Waterworld was popular enough that we need a sequel series to go they to found, streaming. They found land. Yeah, I don't know. Did they, sorry, I, I, spoiler. Spoiler, didn't they, thanks. Didn't yeah. they... <laughs> Maybe Did it'll be a find... prequel series. I, I don't know. I, okay. I don't know why this is happening or why we is Costner that. in it. Can Costner be in it with his webbed feet? And Maybe it'll be a crossover with Yellowstone. He wears a cowboy hat while swimming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Jennifer Garner has signed a deal with Netflix, multi-picture deal, multi-year deal. And in that, she is also going to be doing a sequel to Yesterday. So oh, did you ever uh, see the I never, I never watched the Yesterday. I did not either. My family watched it without me one day. I think it sure. kind of came out while we were like working on a lot of overtime and stuff, and they just made a movie night while I wasn't around, and, and they seemed to enjoy it. So, And it All did right. well enough on Netflix where they want to do more, so good on them. Uh, sticking with Netflix, we also got news that they acquired a movie called Fast and Loose, which is being directed by David Leach and starring Will Smith. So a big new Will Smith movie coming to Netflix. Um, they also announced this week no sequel to Six Underground. They kind of came out and admitted that that movie was just not what they wanted. It, it did okay for them. Uh, it it was actually it is still in the top ten all time of Netflix streaming things. Really, um, it was higher than Enola, Enola Holmes, higher than Old Guard, and both of them are getting sequels. So, but for some reason they thought Six Underground was not Wait. good enough creatively for them to make a sequel. But that one ended. The opposite, like set of, up to do that more, opposite right? of Waterworld, it ended giving you leading down that path. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, dumb. So All right. I guess, Bummer. I guess they're going no. Yeah, they're going no on that one, but we are getting sequels to some of their other stuff. So, uh, Oh, I guess I should have kept this with the sad news. I'm sorry, but did you see there was a movie theater shooting this week, kind of outside of a movie theater? No, no. In, this was in California. You know, I don't know if this is the news spinning it and making it seem like it was because of the movie, because... It was after a showing of The Forever Purge, and then there was a shooting right outside the theater. Of course. Um, mm. And two people did get, uh, actually die. One died right away, and then the other one died like a, a couple days later or whatever. So mm. I'm glad that this story hasn't picked up a lot of steam because I haven't seen a lot of places even reporting it that way because the movie theater industry does not need this, does not need people to now be scared no. to go to the movies for another reason. you know. Sure. Um, yeah. And I guess one of the people that died was kind of like a famous TikTok person, had like millions of followers, whatever. So I don't know if that was the motive or if it was because of the movie. You know, that wasn't really said in the news, and maybe that's why it hasn't picked up the steam. Because I'm hoping it's not somebody coming out of that like, yes, I want to do the forever purge for real. You know, and that wasn't the reason that it happened. Sure, sure. Uh, let's see. We're getting a Pokemon live action show on Netflix, similar to the Detective Pikachu, the way they shot that. This has I'm been, in. like, rumored for a couple of years now, but it looks like it's a go this time. Yeah, I'm in. I like it. And uh, I think Netflix knows that Pokemon is a huge brand, and they've had some real success with some of their stuff they've had on there, so why not? Why not double down on it? Because sometimes you get coworkers that need to go take a break so they can go catch them at different parts yes. of you. Yes, well, you got to catch them all, Brian. I don't know if you know that. you got to catch <laughs> them all. You're in support of it. <laughs> I am in support of it, big time. All right, uh... <laughs> Gerard Butler is suing for profits on Olympus Has Fallen. He wants $10 million extra. Now, this is different than a lawsuit we're going to talk about later and the, the kind of the reasoning for that lawsuit. This is just he sees this as they made money off of it that he did not see on the back end mm -hmm. uh, because they ended up making sequels to these movies, and they were big, and uh, the producers got some extra money in the deal that he was not privy to those profits. So he's trying to fight them on that and says he's owed more money. We'll see. Those movies are whatever. Um <laughs> We talked about before the Taika Waititi Flash Gordon. That was going to be an animated film. Now they're like, hey, why don't we make it live action? I guess they like what they're seeing from Taika and what he's written, and they're trying to convince him now to also direct it. So now it is moving towards a live action project. Oh. Taika's real busy, though. He's got a lot of he stuff on his plate. So we'll see, because he's got that next goal wins, I think, is already finished up, ready to go. He's working on Thor. 
He's uh, doing that pirate show for HBO. Supposedly he's doing a Star Wars thing at some point, True. too. Yeah. So he's got lots of stuff on his plate. So we'll see when this Flash Gordon thing gets going. Um, we had talked about the I Know What You Did Last Summer show, maybe like over a year, year and a half ago that they were doing yeah. this. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't. I feel like we heard nothing else about it since then. So this is coming to Amazon in October. Like, already, we didn't even know it was happening, but it's coming out. So, uh, And this is James Wan, James Wan producing on Amazon, eight episodes coming out in October. They said that it's heavily based on the novel from 1973, which I was today years old when I realized that was based on a novel. I never, I just thought it was a movie, whatever. Huh, interesting. Um, so yeah, and the lead of it is Madison Iceman, who is Bethany in the Jumanji films. Oh, all right. So I'm okay. looking forward to that. Perfect timing. Come out in October. Give me a little quick. I know what you did last summer. I like it. Sure. All what right, are you uh, waiting big, for? <laughs> big news of the week, I think, is Universal has paid $400 million for a new Exorcist trilogy, and they are bringing back Ellen Burstyn to redo her character of Chris McNeil from the first movie. Nice. That's brilliant, right? Really? So, good on them. They've also cast Leslie Odom Jr. to be in the film as like the new kind of dad who has a possessed child or whatever. Um, okay. And this is going to be directed by David Gordon Green, who has had success with the Halloween reboots. Um, you know, we've talked before, wow. Exorcist Big is names. one of those ones that, that they were trying to keep their people's hands off of and didn't want to reboot but sure. i guess yeah big names big enough money here that they were like yep let's do it uh blumhouse producing it uh they said part one will be a theatrical release for sure october of 23 and then they said the possible sequels after that might just go to, to straight to peacock to the streaming but we'll see right. so at least they've committed to the first one being a hundred percent you know in the theater type movie and setting up this new trilogy so interesting interesting right I think that's it for me for regular news. I got some DC Marvel for later. Officially, Sweet Tooth Season 2 has been announced. Yay! That's good. We all, I like that we show. We all assumed that would happen, but just like you were mentioning with Six Underground, we assumed they would get one there. It did. It's officially been announced. We are getting that. Uh, Jodie Whittaker is done playing Doctor Who. She's out. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, they haven't announced any casting yet, though? Nah, she still has one more <clears throat> season to complete, so I guess that once that night, and that's her third. Don't quote me on that, Doctor Who. Maybe that fans. sounds about right. I, I yeah. think it's her third, and then she's done. And, and also, one of the main showrunners is is out after the next one. Well, um, and they usually do that switch around Christmas. Like they'll do it with their Christmas. That's like a big special for them that they do a Christmas special, and that's mm -hmm. where they'll kind of change hands with the Doctor. So maybe that's when okay. they'll do it. Um, moving things around once again, Clifford the Big Red Dog has been pulled from its September release date. Darn. Well, and maybe that's, you know, I wonder if that's something behind the scenes where they're like, ooh, this is nightmare fuel. Maybe we need to rethink this. So they're citing concerns over the Delta variant with COVID, which, yeah. you know, that makes everyone like, oh, come on, don't do this again. Don't don't start pushing again. We already have a loaded frickin' fall as it is with uh -huh. movies every single weekend. No complaints there, but um, I'm hoping this isn't just domino number one. I'm hoping you're right. I'm hoping people saw that trailer and they're like, what the F is this? And maybe they're like, oh, let's use this as the opportunity to uh, shift yeah. things around. Yeah, because I, I mean, I'd said last week they pushed the UK release of Green Knight. Mm. So, yeah, mm. and that probably would have been big over there. Yeah, so we'll see. Wear your mask, get your vaccinations, folks, so we can keep going to the movies, damn it. That's it for the Hollywood News. On to our DC discussion. Okay, uh, this one's really interesting to me. Matt Ryan, officially out as Constantine now, they have been told to re... Like, they can keep him on Legends of Tomorrow, but he is now going to have to play a different character. So he is ending his arc as Constantine on Legends of Tomorrow. He will be back in Season 7 as a new character named Dr. Gwyn Davies. Okay, I'm not and familiar they, with the Gwyn Davies character. Um, no, that's, I, I don't think anybody Why is, wouldn't you uh, cast a new... They, they said this is because of the HBO Max, J.J. Abrams plan to do Constantine and do the whole, you know, Justice League Dark, whatever they're doing over there. So sure. they said we can't have, we don't want two Constantines at the same time. We need to get get rid of this guy. Does he do a good job as Constantine on Legends? He's fantastic. He's fantastic. Yeah, he's great. A lot of people wanted him to continue in the J.J. Abrams thing. Um, I mean, he had his own show before Legends as Constantine. So he's been playing the role for 10 years or something. Um, hmm. 
it's a shame. I did hear that J.J. Abrams is maybe leaning towards casting a black actor as Constantine, so they do want to go like a completely different kind of way with it as well. Sure. So maybe that has something to do with it. But I feel like Legends is probably wrapping up, so why not just let him finish out the finish show out. before the other one yeah. gets going? Yeah. Weird. Um, there's been some set picks online of the Flash movie, and it looks like we're getting Batfleck back. Yes. At least at least a stuntman has been seen like in his outfit. Yeah. So uh, I haven't heard anything official other than that as far as Ben Affleck coming back. So I hope it's more than just that, just you sure. know, the stuntman. But yeah, the, headli- cool. the headlines were screaming that it was it was him. I, I think I'm with you that it was a stuntman, but either way, it's that character. It's that sure, Batman. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, as well as there's been rumors or talks of J.K. Simmons coming back for Batgirl. To play Commissioner Gordon. I'm all in on that. We just did our J.K. Simmons spotlight. Well done. Uh, and <laughs> I think that would be cool to keep that character going. We were saying how we didn't get to see enough of him. So, Right. Um, I mean, the only the, – the question then there is it opens it up since he's in that Batgirl. That Batgirl then should be in – Justice League, yeah. Snyder cuts, Justice League, et cetera, et cetera. You know, those worlds. Yeah. The same reason that Matt Ryan's probably, like, they don't want him being in in the HBO Max show. Well, that means if he's in that, that means he's connected to Legends, which then Legends crossed over with all the other yeah. crap that's on sure. CW. Yeah. So that's probably the biggest reason. But to JK, that connects all those worlds. So people's minds are going nuts. And, and that makes it open for Batfleck to exist in that same world as the Batgirl as well. So could he sure. show up in that? Like even just as Ben Affleck, as, as Bruce Wayne, not even necessarily Batman, but right. great, let's do it. Keep him going. Give me that Batfleck movie that I want. Sure, sure. Um, but uh, this is going to be a different Barbara Gordon, though. Uh, yeah. Right, it, it can't be his daughter. Well, I don't know. Maybe the Flash will have something to do with she, that, I, like whatever happens. I'm forgetting, the, I'm forgetting the actress's name, but the actress is, <clears throat> is the girl from in the Heights. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or uh, she's Hispanic, right? Yeah, Hispanic. Yeah. Well, may, maybe J.K.'s wife in this is Hispanic, and, and she's just mixed. Easy right. fix. There you go. Okay, we fixed it. That was all I saw in DC. Do you have something else? Same, same. So let's move along to the Marvel Minute. Marvel. I saw uh, Gaspard Uliel has been cast as Midnight Man in Moon Knight. Um, I'm not really familiar with the whole Moon Knight world or whatever. Not at all. You know? no. So I guess he's just kind of another, like maybe a, a secondary villain to the show. Because we okay. already had, I think it's Ethan Hawke, was supposed to be like the main yes. villain of the show. So this guy will kind of just maybe be another secondary villain of the show. Interesting. Um, set photos again on Spider-Man No Way Home have shown that Feast will be shown in this movie. Um, and I guess fans of the comics, I'm not really that in-depth to know, is set up by the character of Mr. Negative. So maybe we will see Mr. Negative in the next Spider-Man uh, movie. Interesting. Is, he's never been in any movies or anything that I can think of, right? No, no. No so that, that would be kind of fun, yeah. Uh, There's also I know Doctor big. Strange uh, picks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that Mr. Sorry. Negative character, I know he's big in the games, and uh, he's been kind of fun in the games. So maybe they're ah, okay. trying to ride that that popularity there. Uh, we also got a date for Hawkeye. The new show, Hawkeye, is coming out. Uh, November 24th. Yeah. So mark your calendars now. Yeah. Looking forward to it, especially now that we got Flow Poo definitely in there too. Yeah. I was going to say, watch Black Widow, folks, and you'll probably be even more pumped for uh, for Hawkeye. Stick around for that post credit. And then the big story of the week, I guess, is Scarlett Johansson suing Disney over the Black Widow release, saying that the streaming release hindered her ability to make more money because there weren't as many theaters, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and Disney kind of sh- fired back and said, hey, you already got $20 million. Like, <laughs> right. yeah. what are you thinking here? Uh, and then this also kind of started a roller coaster of other people jumping on board, too. Like now uh, Emma Stone possibly going to be suing over Cruella as well. Um, right. And then the most interesting part of that, though, the story I saw was that Feige agrees and kind of backs ScarJo's position. Does he? That's interesting. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of. I've been thinking about this since this, this released uh, not too long after you recorded. It was just last week, as usual. So I've had I had a couple of minutes to think about it. I don't know. I'm seeing both sides here. You know, uh, Disney's excuse when they came back, they said this is insensitive to the times yeah. and the pandemic that we just all went through and it's insensitive on their part and they're not wrong there 
Um, but then she's not wrong. She signed a contract that would give her certain monies on the back end. The $60 million opening weekend it made off of Disney Plus, she doesn't see a dime. That all goes in Disney's pocket. So you can't blame her there. Like, yeah. in my in my thought process, unless there is a bigger thing at play here with Emma Stone jumping on and, and further down the road, maybe Blunt and The Rock also jumping on. Is well, like, could Disney have just like showed up at her doorstep and said, "Hey, here's ten percent. Here's six million bucks. Thanks, bye." I guess well, I was. I'm, think, to, I'm know, thinking. Know, but... I'm just thinking back to the news here. Didn't we already see Blunt and Krasinski say they were going to sue over Quiet Place? Sure. And then I thought Wonder Woman. I thought Patty Jenkins and Gal Gadot actually. They went, did. They got like ten million dollars extra from Warner Brothers, HBO, whatever for yeah. that. They settled so, before the suit. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just – yeah, it's interesting why Disney would want to make this publicly a big lawsuit and not just say, hey, yeah, you're right. Let's give you a little bit more of this or whatever. Yeah, I, I mean I guess in their heads they're thinking we took a bath on this too. Like we were True. expecting more money coming too. You know, the pandemic hurt us as well, and we paid you $20 million uh, just yeah. for this. We paid um, you I, $20 million. It was a huge budget. We're not going to make that back. Yeah, and I, I think also on her – and she has a, a producer credit too. So it's more than just the money. You know, she would have made a lot more money as a producer, and I think maybe sure. that's more where this is coming from. Was Stone producer on Cruella? I believe so. Yeah. Maybe that's more so where this is coming from because they definitely would have made more money that end okay. of it. Maybe. But, yeah. And so, this should have been stuff that they talked about when they announced these to be, you know, and same thing with HBO is dealing with with the day and date. You know, they needed to work this out with the people and work this into their contracts. So yeah, maybe we are going to see more of this still. Because we've got, uh, although Jungle Cruise was the last one Disney had announced, at least, as being straight to premiere. Right. Uh, I think they were hoping to maybe go away from it after this if theaters were back and robust, you know. Uh, HBO is riding it out to the end of the year with their whole thing, but next year they won't be doing it. So this yeah. might just be a little blip in history where this one year it was like this, and you might have to make con some concessions here. I do feel contracts going forward will all have this language at the very bottom, like saying, hey, if a pandemic sure. hits or, you know, if we can't. It's funny. It does make me then think of like Netflix. Like what do their contracts look like? Because you, know, yeah. you never hear, you never see Netflix's numbers. So their contracts yeah. with all of their big name actors who are now going to those have to be, you're, we're paying you six million bucks. That's it. Act. You know, no matter what the, the numbers say type thing, which is and, very and weird that. for some actors. And to that, with Netflix, they're not paying exhibition. It, it's just on their app. It's not like they have to pay it to another movie house or pay anything. Like right. Everything's in-house for them. So that can also change their budget and things like that. So, true, true. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting thing right now in, in the ever-changing world of how these things are happening. And I really think, based on these couple movies that have come out recently, Black Widows, Jungle Cruises, huge, huge budgets that aren't necessarily making their money back, we might see a few years now where we have a real retraction in Hollywood with less big budget stuff right you know yeah. or or that's going to be your movie theater going is just going to be big blockbustery stuff and those are only going to be in theaters not allowed to come to streaming right away because we need to make our money back we need to get that budget back and then your smaller indie stuff can continue to do this day and date release or whatever valid that's it man interesting that's stuff it. yeah did you have anything else for marvel that's now? it for my marvel okay. cool let's go forward all right, uh, big releases of the week this week are Suicide Squad uh, in theaters and on HBO Max. We will definitely be checking that out and have a review for you on 2.52 next week. Um, also in theaters is John and the Hole, which was a small release at Sundance. And I heard some interesting right. things about that. Um, right. Probably catch up with that down the road, but it is on my, my radar. As well as Vivo, we said, will be on Netflix. So if we get a chance to watch that, maybe we'll have a review next week. Um, also, the documentary Val is hitting Prime. It's already been out in theaters for a couple weeks, but it is now hitting Prime. Um, I had mentioned last week that I was going to watch the Netflix documentary Pray Away that comes out actually tomorrow. Um, and then there's a new show coming to FX on Hulu. I might have to check it out called Reservation Dogs. And it's like dealing with Native American culture or whatever, but I think it's like these kids who are kind of inspired by reservoir dogs and like yeah. want to be these like robbers or whatever. Looks right. kind of fun, interesting. Um, as well as Stargirl is returning for its second season on the 10th. So that's actually next Tuesday, I guess, but I wanted to mention it now. Just get it on your radars. As the official podcast of DCW. <laughs> so there you go. That's it for going forward. I can't think of anything else. Uh, do we have anything coming forward for us? Um, I will be done with Kevin can F himself. 
The okay. final episode just dropped uh, Sunday night. I haven't seen the finale yet. Uh, so for those of you who got to watch it already, you're already ahead of me. But the finale was Sunday night. I'll have watched that, so I'll be able to review that entire series that we give a first take on. That's Andy Murphy's show on gotcha. uh, AMC. Uh, for Take Two Podcast Thursday, you get the poll that drops across all of your socials. Facebook, keep it up, folks. Keep those comments coming there. Twitter, Instagram, of course, keep voting as you do. And then this weekend, you get a brand new spotlight. It is on an actress who was in a DC film. I forget what your 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 uh, tease was on the last spotlight. I, I it was a really it good too. tease, and I forgot what it was. I'll tell you what, I'm having a blast. Uh, I'm excited for that one because I've done a lot of homework. I've gone back to the 80s and watched some of her Australian work even. Um, I've watched a TV show that I've talked about watching for a long time. So did a lot of homework for, for this actress. So I'm looking forward to that spotlight. Other than that, folks, you can just go back into your feed, catch up, and we would love, absolutely love, if you would give us a five-star rating and review. They absolutely do help the show out. It's been a minute since we've got one. So five-star rating and review would be great. We would love to get one today that's it for episode 251 have a great night everybody see you